Jaden, will you be dropping the slide? Good morning, everyone. I call to order today the uh, Kansas Corporation Commission work study on Wednesday, January 25th at nine o'clock. I'm Susan Duffy, serving as chair of the commission. And with me today are a number of people, but primarily I see Commissioner Keene and Commissioner French have joined us, as well as a variety of staff and invited guests. Today is the first of a series of commission workshops that we have developed over the last month or so to further educate, inform, bring to light issues that staff and commission uh, commissioners believe are important uh, for this particular commission. Uh, this is a two hour workshop. My understanding is that we will be asking questions throughout the presentation commissioners. Um, and our master of ceremonies today is Jeff McClanahan and he serves as the director of utilities. Um, I would like to, Jeff, before we get started, quickly announce that on February 8th from 10 to 12 will be another workshop and on February 17th from nine to 11. So if you have not put those on your calendar, please do. And I appreciate everybody being here um, as usual. If there is a problem, a technical issue, we have folks standing by, so please make sure that we are aware of that. Jeff, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Um, just to dovetail a little bit, uh, Commissioner Duffy, you, you were indicating that we've got a couple of other work studies already uh, scheduled, and then we're, we're also working on additional work studies, so there will be more to follow. Uh, first, let me introduce members of KCC staff who uh, are participating today. Uh, Justin Grady is our Chief of Revenue Requirements, Cost of Service and Finance. And Leo Hanos is our Chief of Energy Operations and Pipeline Safety and is also our Chief Engineer. Uh, Curb is also participating today. Uh, David, would you like to introduce your staff? Thank you, Jeff. This is Dave Nickel with Curb. And today I have in the Zoom call, uh, Joseph A. Streb, Todd Love, and myself. I don't see that Josh France or Patrick Orr have joined in the, in the Zoom call, but they may have joined by some other means. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, before I turn it over to Black and Beach, uh, I wanted to take just a few minutes to explain why staff and the commission believes these resource adequacy work studies are needed and what the general topics are planned to be. Staff has been tracking the transition to renewable generation in Kansas, the Southwest Power Pool, and other regional transmission organizations that have deregulated generation markets for a number of years. As renewable energy resources continue to grow nationwide and aging gas, coal, and nuclear facilities are being retired, careful planning is going to be required to ensure adequate energy generation and reliability during winter and summer peaks, as well as in the event of extreme weather events. So the physical attributes of the various generation options must be taken into consideration. These considerations include the intermittency of renewable resources, fuel availability, and the cost for thermal generation and outage rates for all generation types. Moreover, the considerations we will be discussing have been expressed as reliability concerns by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation in several of its seasonal reliability reports. A NERC spokesman has stated that it's clear the risks are spreading and the pace of our grid transformation is a bit out of sync with the underlying realities and the physics of the system. So the fundamental purpose of these work studies is to educate ourselves in order to be better prepared to address the complicated uh, resource planning decisions the commission will face in the near future. Uh, Tony Clark, who's a former FERC commissioner, recently wrote an article on the subject 
And a quote from his article clearly describes how quickly the landscape has changed and is continuing to change regarding resource adequacy. Mr. Clark stated, hardly a week goes by without reports regarding the growing threat of electricity blackouts in the U.S. It brings to mind Ernest Hemingway's line and the sun also rises about bankruptcy happening. Two ways, gradually, then suddenly. For years, electric reliability has been an increasing concern. Nonetheless, it's all a bit jarring to see evidence that much of the U.S. is shifting from the gradually phase of electric reliability decline and into the suddenly phase. With that, we are excited to have Black & Beach with us today. Black & Beach is a highly respected engineering firm providing services across the globe. Today, they're going to provide a technical discussion on the current generation mix, reliability issues with continued transition to variable generation, whether coal generation can be sufficiently replaced by new and existing natural gas generation, given concerns for fuel availability and deliverability, address supply chain issues and implications, as well as emerging technologies that will support a transition to renewables. So with that, let me introduce Paige Burke, who's the Project Manager for Government and Environment with the Black and Beach. And uh, we'll let Black and Beach take it away. Thank you, Paige. Uh, th this is Marcus. I believe Paige had to drop off. Um, she was having issues with the, the volume or not being able to hear. So I think she dropped off and we'll rejoin here hopefully soon. Um, if you would like, I can try and get us started until she's available. That's, that's fine. Looks like we're she's at. back. Yeah. She's back. All right. Hi, guys. Sorry. I can hear now. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> That's kind of important, Paige. Well, yeah, at the beginning, you're like, has it started? And I just don't hear anything. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Are you ready for me to share the slides? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. My apologies for that. Best laid plans, right? Right. Is that working? Yes. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yay. Okay. There we go. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. All right. And then I think, Casey, you're going to start it. You guys just let me know when it advance the slides. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm Casey Hicks. I'm our client account manager for Black & Beach. I cover uh, all the major electric utilities in the north central part of the U.S. for us. So um, work work a lot with different regions and um, we as Black and Beach are very excited to be here to uh, to be able to present this workshop to you guys and appreciate you all inviting us here and and uh, Jeff as as everyone was talking there in the introduction please as questions come up throughout this don't don't hesitate to ask questions uh, as as we're going through this so um, our our plan for this as far as the outline to go through here we'll do a really brief black and beach introduction to talk a little bit about us and our background uh, we'll go into grid and reliability needs and then we'll uh, talk about some coal unit retirements and and how that's playing into the the mix here uh, fuel availability and delivery issues associated with natural gas which i think we've all become all too well aware of in some of these cold snaps we've had in the last several years um, and then a big thing that we at Black and & Beach and, and a lot of others in the industry have dealt with, which is supply chain issues uh, for the renewable trans transition here that we're going through. And then we'll touch on some, some new and exciting stuff with emerging technologies, um, and, then, and then look at a technology uh, outlook with the reliability and resilience of, of uh, renewables. We'll go to the next one, Paige. So as I said, I'm Casey Hicks. Um, so Black & Veatch, we're, we're a very large uh, engineering company uh, in, in the energy space. We also do a lot of work. Uh, Paige and, and her team does a lot of work in the government's um, side. We have water, wastewater, uh, lots of things. We're, we're closing in on, I, I would assume by the end of this year, we'll be close to 10,000 professionals um, in 120 offices. Uh, our headquarters is in Overland Park, Kansas. Uh, we're 50 years uh, 
outside the U.S., um, but you know, lots over a hundred years within within the U.S. Uh, as a company, we're 100 percent employee owned uh, projects in 100 countries and six continents. So we bring a really diverse uh, perspective on a lot of these things, knowing that we we don't just see what's going on in the U.S. We see what's going on globally as well, um, and we're very familiar with that from supply chain to to trends to when we start talking about emerging technologies, there's obviously things happening um, outside the U.S. that um, are already uh, up and running. So the our, our expansive history outside the U.S. really helps us understand what's coming um, and, and how that plays globally. So um, we're four plus billion dollars uh, in revenue last year, which was a record year for us, which was really exciting. Um, and you know, a lot of people know us as an engineering company, but I think a, a big, a big bullet point on this slide for us to push is the the ten and a half million dollar million, sorry, not dollars, but site hours in in craft. So in two thousand and one, so we do have a very large both uh, union and open shop arms of our company that we self perform construction as well. So not only do we see this from an engineer's perspective, we see it from a construction perspective and how you actually go build and implement and the challenges that come with that. So um, our mission is, is building a world of difference through innovation and sustainable infrastructure. We've put a lot of investment in the last several years into uh, the sustainable infrastructure, standing up groups that do nothing but focus on things like hydrogen and, and those emerging technologies out there to make sure that we're um, a leader in understanding those in, in, times before we need to understand them. So um, our vision is uh, what future we aspire to achieve. Uh, we work relentlessly to solve humanity's critical infrastructure challenges and our values are uh, we believe in and how we behave, safety, accountability, collaboration, entrepreneurship, integrity, ownership, and respect. So, um, and, and a big one there is safety, right? As that's a, a very, very instrumental part in what we do at Black and & Beach and, and all of our stuff starts with safety. So um, we'll, we'll bring that perspective to all of these as, as making sure we, we build in and operate things safely is, is a very important part of all of this. So, so we're, we're talking Kansas here. So there's, there's no place like home for us. So obviously, uh, you know, we were established in 1915 uh, to get work, do work. And, and I think that's held very, very true. So, um, in over a hundred years, you know, we've, we've always had a very, very heavy history in Kansas city, um, on both sides of the state line with our water group, um, in Kansas city, Missouri, and, and our energy group, um, in, in Overland park, Kansas. And then, uh, in 2009, we made Kansas our global headquarters. So our Overland park office, that's, uh, in Kansas City. So um, I, I think that, you know, these are all really important things. And I think that's part of why we were so excited to, to be here today is, you know, Kansas is near and dear to our heart. And we want to make sure that the, that you guys are informed and, and we can help however we can. So um, we do, as, as I talked before, we do a lot of stuff with engineering procurement and construction so we do everything from from the beginning to the end um, building a world of difference as I said that's that's this is our our mission statement here so um, some of the things that that we're really working hard on um, and and helping a lot of our clients and, and other members uh, in Kansas is decarbonization obviously this is a huge thing right now whether that be retirement of coal conversion of coal um, development of renewables, um, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into decarbonization and some of it will talk on that environmental footprint there, but um, sustainable water management, minerals and waste, the, the environmental footprint um, plays a big, big role in decarbonization. So uh, we don't just look at, when we talk about carbon, we don't just look at what what's coming out the stack of a power plant, but there, there's a lot of downstream effects that are becoming really, really important for people to look at um, about, you know, your, your manufacturing process of the equipment that you're, that you're buying. And all of those things are becoming more and more important when you look at, at a carbon footprint, um, not just what, 
your manufacturing or, or your direct um, carbon output is, but what all other things are you doing from your, your vehicles that you're using to, to service and do things uh, all the way down to how, how was that bolt or nut made that you're installing in the field? So that's, that's what we talk about when we talk about environmental footprint. Um, resilient and adaptive infrastructure um, system connectivity is, is those are becoming very big things. We're all talking about LTE and, and how we communicate from device to device and, and how we make all of that better to make our system smarter and, and, and do things more efficiently. Um, and then community and, and social resilience is, is equally important to make sure that we're doing the right things uh, socially and in our communities that we live and work in um, all across the globe. So while I'm going to kick it over to you and let you take this. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I think um, my name is Hua Fang and I actually live in, um, I work off the, the Houston office of, of Black and & Beach. And um, right now I'm sitting in a hotel room in New Orleans for a conference. So I think I'm probably going to turn off the video in a couple of minutes, just to make sure that I don't really um, jeopardize the uh, the fragile hotel uh, Wi-Fi network. Um, I have uh, I'm an economist by training, and I have been with Black and Beach for over twenty years uh, with the consulting division. Uh, right now, I'm a managing director within Global Advisory, uh, the consulting division, and um, my um, expertise where I have spent the 20 years on really looking into the energy market from an um, economic um, as well as long-term uh, strategic planning perspective. And I lead our energy market perspective, uh, which is um, a long-term energy outlook, integrating developments in environmental policy, uh, generation resources, um, as well as um, um, tech kind of new technologies and and fuel markets development um and such, such as natural gas or alcohol and uh we we do that update maybe um once a year and i think we just really try to incorporate most recent data um data points and having it has a, a really base co um base case view regarding what's going to happen in different markets in north america um, I also co-lead um, strategy and planning practice, providing utilities uh, for kind of long-term planning services, um, asset strategy, as well as any, any kind of commercial and regulatory, regulatory needs. Um, next slide page, please. This is the one you want, Hua? Or you want the next one? Uh, the generation mix. Oh, okay. Okay. Is yeah. It, is it switching? Okay. I think there's a little delay. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, it, it appears my screen shows my name. Uh, I think if you could um, maybe switch down to the next slide, showing the actual slides. Um, you guys see? What I'm seeing is a generation mix. Oh, okay. So that's good. I think they see it. I don't. Not yes, either, we do see uh, MISO and SPP current generation mix. It's okay. that hotel Wi-Fi, Wa. Yeah, you've already <laughs> yeah, <it>. that... <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I'm I'm delayed. Um, so this chart really shows um kind of the current uh picture of uh what generation mix are operating meeting client needs in MISO and SPP. I think one unique thing that you can actually identify from this chart immediately that um, we see that um, a large amount of energy comes from coal and, and natural gas. And I would actually like to point out the unfortunate choice of colors. We actually put coal as green, which is um, counterintuitive <laughs> here. But I mean, over 68% of um, generation in, in MISO and 55% of generation in SPP comes from um, uh, coal and, and natural gas. Um, so the um, if you look into kind of into detail, I think they, um, 
somewhat uh, alarming trend is that um, coal represented over 20% of total generation capacity. And I think um, then when you talk about um, the, the trend of environmental consciousness and um, trying to reduce the carbon footprint, I think coal capacity are most um, vulnerable uh, to future uh, likely retirements. I think that is the issue that could be facing the uh, both MISO and SPP region regarding what will be the replacement for those capacities. And we talk about that this is just a name play, a name plate capacity mix um, in terms of um, different generation technology shares. Um, we can also um, change that. And I think there was a question regarding changing this chart to reflect the electric, um, elect, um, the ELCC uh, from different generation resource. I think we are working on a couple slides, uh, a couple charts that really just reflect the ELCC. Um, the ELCC is the effective uh, load carrying capacity, which represents that even though you get nameplate capacity, some of those generation will not be um, dispatchable or uh, will not become online on command. And that will de like really derate how much capacity it could uh, provide during peak hours. Um, so in this chart, um, the, um, we know solar, we actually have some numbers regarding solar and wind ELCCs in MISO and, and SPP. Um, solar has a little uh, slightly higher ELCC because both MISO and SPP are heavy on wind. So the ELCC on wind were, um, were less uh, in both um, SPP and, and um, MISO. But solar comes from somewhere between like five to ten percent to uh, fifty to seventy percent on ELCC, depending on what kind of resource um, we're counting here. On um, hydro, um, our kind of assumption is that um, hydro, the run of river, may have various uh, rate of uh, ELCC depending on the availability of um, of the uh, of water uh, in different seasons. And I think if it's pump hydro, we, we believe that pump hydro can come as 100% with a ELCC of almost 100%. Um, all the other capacity, the thermal capacities, we think are uh, fairly close to be 100% um, uh, ELCC, but for the, um, the outage rate, the false outage rate. So, I mean, uh, in all of the regions, we think the false outage rate is going to be less than 10%. So that will um, really um, change um, that. So the, the, if we look at this chart from different uh, uh, using the ELCC as a consideration, we think that uh, gas and coal will, the share of gas and coal is gonna go up just because both wind and solar has to be derated to affect, uh, to uh, reflect their potential um, um, unavailability during some of the peak hours. Well, okay. could I ask a quick question yeah. about about um, accreditation of some of those traditional resources, specifically um, gas and coal? Is so uh, you know what you talked about is you know the the outage rates are problematic and probably need to be reflected in their accreditation, um, you know, to reflect that there are times even even though they are generally dispatchable, there are times where they're unavailable. I think a trend we've also noticed or something we're, we're trying to quantify is that, um, you know, both the outages and sort of the fuel availability <laughs> or, or issues with fuel happen to be correlated with extreme weather events. And so, you know, the times when you really need um, those resources maybe the times where they're most vulnerable, they might have more correlated outage rates during those times. Are there any metrics that you all have seen to try to capture that vulnerability? Um, I think um, I, I, I know where the, <laughs> the question comes from. And I think um, ERCOT is the, uh, the case in point regarding vulnerability of some thermal generation. Um, I think what ERCOT has done is that essentially they have put in those what they call the weatherization effort um, for power plant. They have the requirement making sure that um, the, the plant invest in some um, um, kind of improvement to make sure their equipment won't freeze during uh, cold weather event. And I think also the 
um, it, it should be some of the operating um, kind of issues you actually need to have a co-pile um, on, on site. Um, but I think uh, weatherization for natural gas plants is a little bit different is that in that sense that um, you, you can make sure that the power plant is ready to go during cold weather conditions. The problem is that if you do not have natural gas that's going to be transported underground uh, through pipes uh, to you and I think then then it's still going it's still not going to work. So the issue with this is that um, we think, that uh, the coal piles and the coal plants can be fully weatherized to really prevent um, any cold event disruptions by having a coal pile and I think making sure the all the equipment were upgraded. But for natural gas um, plants, there are two components to this. One is that making sure the equipment is good to go, your pipes are going to freeze. Um, in addition to that, there is a matter of uh, whether um, you need to hold a certain level of firm gas supply during certain conditions, because right now um, the gas market is very competitive. So like during cold weather conditions, the natural gas are more likely to be um, moved, shipped to um, customers in the residential commercial sector to make sure that they are they have enough gas for heating purposes. I think power plant, they typically do not hold firm rights to the gas transportation rights on the pipeline system. So some, some, sometimes it's just like they were on a second tier of um, allocating supplies by um, kind of by the market design. Uh, what we have uh, learned is that um, in ERCOT, what they have done is the weatherization of the equipments um, on the facility side is done, but I think they're like the uh, natural gas plants are not required mm -hmm. to hold uh, firm supply contracts. Um, I, I, I think this is a, a matter we're going to talk a little bit in, in later slides is that um, there are ways for gas plant to sign up for, um, for, nat for firm natural gas um, during um, those extreme conditions. Um, however, um, that's, those were extremely cost con costly contracts, and I think that's going to increase um, the because it's, you're just holding that for um, for like it's kind of like an insurance contract. You don't expect that to be ut utilized very often. But um, based on that, once you use that, you know that's going to be really under very extremely tight market conditions. So that makes those kind of contracts very very costly. And um, I think um, it just need to be balanced in terms of understanding the cost of firm fuel versus the, the cost of the electricity that generates from that. Thank you, Wa. That's it's a complex area. And I, and I apologize if I got ahead of your <laughs> slides a little bit. Yep. Wa, can you confirm which slide you're on just so I make sure I'm matched up with you? I know you can't. Uh, right mm -hmm. now we are on slide five, right? Okay, yeah, like, let's let's go to next slide. And, and any other questions on this? Okay, let's go to slide six. Uh, um, hold yeah, on. So see, okay, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm, I'm on slide 10. So if you go to slide 11. This is 11. Meso okay. seasonal generation. Right, right. So uh, I think this is just hourly kind of snapshot of uh, what resources are dispatching during different hours. And I think it's not um, very um, kind of surprisingly, what we see is that you see wind and solar are, are sometimes they have some fluctuations. And when you do see fluctuations um, for those resources, um, you see natural gas and coal sometimes as a catch all, trying to make up for the, uh, for the difference um, where it's between supply and, and demand. And I think more if we, kind of look a little bit closer, we see the variation in coal generation um, is um, slightly less than the variation in natural gas generation. So essentially is that um, when load is high enough and then wind and solar are not um, sufficient to meet load, um, you will be first base loading some of the coal generation and then you actually have um, 
get natural gas generation, part of base loading and part of them are um, providing peaking services is that in summertime, when the load is really high, natural gas is going to be um, just coming on and off to meet um, the hourly needs. They, um, I, I think what we have tried to represent here is really just a snapshot from the key generation resource mix. Um, the, the line, the black line represents the actual load for the hour. And I think then we have um, pick out the key resources. But if you see there was a little bit kind of like a not balancing perfectly during some hours, you see some white gaps below the white line um, in some hours. And then you have some, see some like a slightly spill over of the um, generation above the load line. So those were the catch all that for some, because, and I think those generation would represent um, maybe net uh, imports or exports um, that were needed for that hour to meet load requirement because the imports and exports were not reported on an hourly basis. So in order to capture that, um, so I think we we just really aggregate that into the little wet line that represent the, the balancing energy that's are needed um, in order to um, to meet load perfectly. So every hour we know every megawatt hour, every megawatt of load requirements is is met. And I think we are generating just enough to meet the load. And I think the extra uh, generation will be exported to other regions. And then the, ex the, the wet space represent maybe net imports into the region. Um, next slide, Paige. Um, same story with, with SPP. And it essentially is that um, if you see variability during peak summertime and natural gas generation are always um, there to pick up the slack. I think the coal generation in SPP are slightly more volatile. Basically, we are, it's, it's picking up more of the variations um, in the uh, renewable dispatch. Uh, renewable uh, production. And I think uh, natural gas, of course, is always there to be kind of the units to balance demand and supply when needed. Um, I think uh, any, uh, any questions on those slides? Okay. Um, this I think somebody else provide this slide. Okay, Paige, that's slide my slide. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, Kevin, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Hua and and uh, Paige. Great to be here with you all. So. My name is Kevin Ludwig. Uh, I lead our grid solution portfolio at Black & Beach. So that's all of our transmission and distribution um, assets that we work on and, and develop along with uh, the services we perform on those. I am involved in projects in both the US and uh, those outside of the United States. Um, so um, just really wanted to focus in on some of the, the items that I think you wanted to hear uh, with this presentation. And I will get into some uh, technical type definitions. Um, if for whatever reason uh, it's not clear, please interrupt me. Um, I'll try and relate them to hopefully things that you're aware of and performance that you're, you're aware of as well. So uh, one thing you know that I wanted to highlight is uh, changing grid leads to new topology. So um, as Casey mentioned, due to our work globally, we do see change in, in other grids. Um, I would say that uh, Europe, I think, is, as we're all aware, is probably further ahead than the United States in the so-called energy transition. So they've certainly been on a path to decarbonization well in advance of the United States. And so when you look at that, you can kind of see some trends that happen there and then how that will impact our grid as well. So. Uh, with uh, a changing grid, what we do see is a retiring of synchronous generators. Uh, by a synchronous generator, what I'm referencing is the generation in a coal or natural gas power plant. 
Um, and uh, I'll get into the definition of variable generation here in a moment. But whenever we have that loss of, of coal and natural gas, it goes beyond just the fuel supply and that dispatchability as it relates to fuel. Um, the electrical characteristics are also different. So uh, what we see is that uh, you do need to add some additional ingredients to the grid. Um, those ingredients look like uh, we start needing dynamic reactive power uh, that we otherwise didn't in the past because of its inherent uh, availability within synchronous generation. We see a reduction in short circuit current, so we need to look at adding that in. And then also we see a loss of, of grid inertia. And so you see, you have to look at, okay, how can I add that ingredient back into the grid? Uh, so, you know, variable generation here is commonly correlated to renewable generation. Uh, so uh, with renewable generation assets, they are largely inverter-based generation assets. So it is no longer a rotating generator, it is an inverter. And uh, they operate differently than synchronous generators. They have different capabilities. Uh, so that needs to be considered when we're doing this transition to uh, renewable generation assets. Um, now, the important thing to highlight here is that there are proven technologies electrically to supplement what the renewable inverter-based generation can't deliver. And I want to make a specific uh, statement here. When I said electrically, I, I, I really mean electrical performance because there's the separate aspect of the fuel situation, which is, is different. Um, and so, you know, things that we're seeing in the market right now is uh, some trends towards additional demand for those established technologies. Uh, those technologies are FATs. So FAX is an abbreviation for flexible alternating current transmission systems. Um, now what FAX is, is it's a family of, of devices that can deliver um, reactive power um, and, and they can also control power flow. They, these devices are all unique in that they are um, different than traditional assets in terms of their basis is power electronics. So power electronics uh, is, is a technology that we're seeing predominant in the industry because they're in inverters, they're in electric vehicles, um, and also variable frequency drives, which we use a lot in industry to control motors. So you know what we're seeing is this power electronics market has scaled in terms of volume, capability, and technology. That has then allowed for fax devices to also improve and have lower costs associated with them. So I'll get into that in a little bit more into future slides. Kevin, could uh, I ask you a question here? Sure. Uh, just because I think this slide is great, but it, it may be a little ahead of uh, the folks watching online and some of us regulators even um, from a technical standpoint and maybe if we could just set in layman's terms what you mean by the electrical um, you know, qualities that are different. I mean, my understanding is um, you, know, you, you have a certain amount of inertia and other uh, qualities that are provided by traditional resources and inverter-based resources generally you know, coming from renewables um, don't provide those same attributes. And so I, what I think you're saying here is that there are new technologies that can help supplement those generation sources to provide the same quality of electrical uh, output that we get from traditional resources. Is that all? <laughs> Am I tracking? And have you, I, you have did I a great, in layman's terms? <laughs> you did a great job there of presenting uh, in layman terms what I'm getting to in this slide and future slides. Okay. And, and I, uh, I do apologize if I got ahead of you. I just know that um, you know, this potentially could go past some people. <laughs> understand. And, and uh, you know, I, Again, thanks for pointing that out because as I mentioned, <laughs> I want everyone to ask questions so I can get into some details to make sure it is, it is terminology that is understandable. Okay, so that said, Kevin, um, is there a rating system 
um, that goes like with wind versus solar about how much, uh, for example, dynamic reactive power you need or short circuit current or grid inertia, inertia. is there like um, a more of a formulaic or a rating system so that, you know, it's just not a standalone. You can't just have the turbine. You need to have all these others. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And so there's there's two elements here. One is at the point of interconnect with any generation asset, there's performance which must be met. And that performance is stipulated uh, by regulations within NERC and also in the interconnect agreement. So, you know, that that is a must meet criteria for any generation plant, whether it is a conventional generation plant or a renewable generation plant. OK, you were kind of heading to where I was in terms of uh, the reliability on the power side. Um, so that that is already figured in. But what you're saying is this this whole stuff is like sized up to be able to accommodate large sure. producing um, inverter based generation. Correct. And so, you know, where I'm going is when I said that there's two elements, one is the guarantee of performance at the point of interconnect. Now, transmission planners understand the inherent limitations of the renewable generation. And so there is uh, transmission planning functions that happen as all of these devices are looking to interconnect into the grid. And then as these devices become more prevalent and transmission constraints are identified, which would result in reliability issues, the uh, transmission system planners then identify additional elements which must be added into the grid to allow the reliability to main, be maintained. So those functions may exist outside of the plant itself. And it may be a situation where the cumulative effect of many renewable plants result in the addition of a fax device or uh, some other supplemental device in the power system. Okay, so if we're looking to use existing transmission, let's say we're retiring a coal plant and putting an array of solar or something, you're saying if you call the solar, huge solar array a plant, it's got to be there before it hits the transmission. So what, what I'm saying is that huge solar plant in megawatts may be the same in megawatts as the coal plant, but electrically, there may have to be some additional things added to the transmission system beyond just the building of the solar plant, if that okay. makes sense. Yes, it does. Are we talking about physically on site or is this more of a... It, it could be off-site. So okay. it could be, uh, you know... And this is what these devices that I'm referencing are. So a fax device is an offsite asset. So um, another device that we see deployed is a synchronous condenser, which is a essentially, if you think of a coal plant, you have the turbine, which is where the heat energy is going into that turbine to create energy. There's also the generation portion of that coal plant, which is just the generator itself. If you decouple that turbine from the generator, that generation portion can remain connected to the grid. And that is known as a synchronous condenser. And it delivers electrical performance that oftentimes cannot be delivered from a solar plant as an example. All right, um, thank you. Yes, and then the other aspect that we do see is the pairing of battery energy storage systems either as their own or as paired with a solar generation plant. So you have the solar plant itself and then battery energy storage systems co-located next to the solar plant. And then that can also enhance the performance of that plant to give it performance that you would more that's more akin to what you would have with a traditional power generation plant. 
Thank Kevin. you. I appreciate that explanation. Yeah. Kevin Dwight can. Uh, so as I understand what you're really talking about here in terms of these trends in, in new technologies, basically what we're talking about are methods for, if I'm understanding it, compensating for some potential renewable performance vulnerabilities. Is that correct? Yeah, versus, I, I would versus, say it's versus the thermal. Yes, exactly. So it's it's really, you know, I think we're all recognizing that renewable technologies have electrical performance, which is different than a traditional generation facility. Therefore, you need to do things different in the grid to compensate for that. Exactly right. Okay. Going back to one of your earlier uh, in entry points when you began this, this part of our uh, presentation, I believe you indicated that uh, and it's really, it's really to our benefit that we have somebody uh, who has the diversity of experience that you do have internationally as well as uh, domestically. I think you indicated that uh, basically Europe uh, was ahead of the United States, at least in terms of the timing of the transition to renewables. But haven't they also uh, done so at a pace that has created some serious reliability and resilience issues? It, it has. And so I, I actually have a slide that I wanted to go through that highlighted exactly this and then some solutions that were implemented as well. So um, if, it, it would, if it would be fine with you, maybe Paige, you could advance to the next slide. And pardon me, uh, pardon me for getting ahead of you. <laughs> no, it, it's perfectly fine. And, and honestly, it's great to have the dialogue and interest from the group here. Um, so, you know, just going to inertia, because I know that's a topic of interest, um, I wanted to bring an example of, of something that happened in the United Kingdom. And you may ask, why are we talking about the United Kingdom? Well, it, it is a power system. It is fairly large. There's a lot of load. There's a lot of generation. So in the United Kingdom, it was a heavily coal-based generation system. Um, the U United Kingdom historically has had a wealth of coal, and they had a lot of coal generation. Recently, over the last several decades, they've added a tremendous amount of offshore wind. Uh, so for, for those who aren't aware, offshore wind basically envisions erecting very, very large wind turbines, much larger than what we see on land in the ocean, uh, the power is collected on platforms, and then transmission lines are run from the platforms into land, okay? So, so that's kind of the generation system that they've migrated to. So when doing this, uh, there was some effort to understand how that dynamic affected inertia, but not to the level that it should have. And so just, I wanna give you a, a picture of inertia here. So I think all of us are familiar with inertia in some sense, but it is the you know, ability of a system to want to continue in a certain mode of operation, okay? So in the United Kingdom, what that means is their system runs at 50 Hertz. That's the frequency of the system. As you remove inertia from the system, if there's power disruptions, uh, whenever those happen, uh, the lowering of inertia causes that frequency to deviate much faster than it otherwise would. So hopefully I've made that fairly clear so it's understandable. Um, and so what, what happened in the United Kingdom in August 9th of 2019 was they had a lightning strike on some transmission lines. Uh, those, those uh, were actually a line. That lightning strike caused the loss of a, a major uh, link, which caused the loss of a thousand megawatts of generation. Uh, one of the links that was affected was one for an offshore wind project, and then another for a, a conventional generation project. So, you know, when that happened, the United Kingdom electrical system had enough power on reserve to meet that loss of generation. But what it didn't have is enough inertia to maintain that 50 Hertz frequency to the level that it needed to be. So 
all the generation assets that are connected into the power system have what's called under frequency protection. And if the frequency drops below a certain level in an instantaneous fashion, the generation is removed from the system to protect it because generation can't run at this lower frequency. It, it can damage the generation assets. And then you have a situation where you have cascading a loss of, of uh, load and generation. And so in this event, you know, over a million co consumers were disconnected and didn't have generation. So, um, you know, that, that lightning strike caused the loss of power for a million consumers. And so what, what happened is the United Kingdom electrical system operator looked at the event and looked at how it could be prevented. And there was a recognition that additional inertia needed to be added back into the system. So this is a situation where we're adding something in because we retired coal plants that uh, had this, had this ingredient and the new things don't have the ingredient. And so they developed a market, uh, an inertia market. They solicited inertia tenders and uh, received um, uh, offers of inertia from various market participants. And those projects were implemented. Now, in large part, the initial awards were to uh, owners of conventional power plants that had been retired. And what they did was they converted their retired power plants to operate as synchronous condensers, which I briefly explained in the previous slide. But I think this is illustrative of a situation where you know, the UK maybe got ahead of itself in terms of implementing that renewable power and uh, therefore, you know, had an issue and then developed a market solution for it. And those are the type of things that we're seeing, you know, in Germany and the United Kingdom. Any questions on that slide? Okay, uh, Paige, if you could advance to the next slide. Hey, Kevin, um, sorry, just real quick. Uh, this is Justin Grady. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm gonna an accountant financial guy in the utilities division. So I'm not a power engineer, but I, I try to understand anyway. Just a, a real quick question, because I think some of my focus was waning when you were discussing earlier the, syn the synchronous, um, what, what was that term? The Condenser. Yeah, the, syn <laughs> the synchronous yes. condenser. So yes. did I understand that the, the generator itself uh, re remains attached to the grid, but just not any of the steam generation equipment or the turbine? Is that, it just Correct. remains attached to the grid? Correct. You're now a power okay. system engineer. Uh, so that's exactly right. Uh, that's what is happening. And, and those type of things have been done in the United States and have been done in the United Kingdom. And, and what it is, is it's a way that you can leverage an asset that you otherwise would have no value. And, uh, you know, because that generator itself has a lot of value to the grid in terms of ability to deliver and maintain voltage and also an ability to add inertia to the grid. Okay, so so just quickly, I mean, the generator itself is is no longer being spun by a turbine so is it Correct. is it spinning because of the electrical influence of the transmission grid pushing back yes. on it correct okay. correct so so essentially that that uh, generator is still spinning at the frequency in which the power system operates so it would be 3600 rpms and, uh, you know, you've got a significant amount of mass there that then spins at that revolutions per minute, and that adds inertia. Okay. All right. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Yep. Kevin, this, uh, this is Leo Hanos. Um, I am an engineer, but I got a financial question for you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what, what is the um, cost of it? You said that they're, as they scale these up, they're getting to be more and more cost effective. So what is the dollars per megawatt investment that would be necessary to bring one of these on onto a system? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that uh, top of mind and I can get that information to you. And commonly, it's not going to be dollars per megawatt. It'll be dollars per megavolt. 
um, because what you're delivering is not megawatts, but megabars. Um, and then in the UK market, uh, when you talk about inertia, that's valued in, I believe, uh, megawatt seconds. Uh, so that is a unit of measure for inertia. So, th so those are the things and I can certainly get you follow up um, separately with some financial metrics for that. What, one other thing in the uh, UK, since, since the, you know, the renewable power has caused some of those uh, imbalances, do they combine that? Do they couple those together as far as the cost? In other words, does the cost cause or pay for that service in order to get the quality power they need to serve their customers? Yeah, I, I think, you know, what's happening is, you know, they have uh, goals as a, let's call it government or entity to decarbonize their electrical system. So, you know, essentially it is a cost of, of doing business in a sense. However, um, you know, we have to recognize too with the renewable generation, the offshore wind, very heavy CapEx intensive. But on the fuel side of it, really no incremental cost uh, because you're not using any fuel. So it's wind. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some trade-offs there. Uh, so I think it's, it's more of, um, you know, a situation here where, you know, they, they needed these additional elements to make uh, the system operate. And so they developed a market to incentivize the creation of this asset they needed. Um, now, uh, you know, that, that's just kind of, you know, what, what was done in the United Kingdom, but there's various ways that you can do it. I think the other piece of it is, you know, if you look at dollars per megawatt of a solar project versus dollar per megawatt of, let's say a combined cycle project, you know, with incentives and so forth, the solar project's probably cheaper uh, significantly at this point. Now, what we have to also recognize is there are additional grid costs that happen. And, um, you know, I think, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of market reform in terms of how those grid costs are apportioned out. And that's what uh, Q reform is all about, which we're seeing, you know, PJM has a Q reform proposal. I believe that proposal is pretty much adopted by FERC at this point. And, and you know, that was really about how do we get these grid costs apportioned out in a more equitable manner. Maybe okay, I'll just you. make a, I'll make a, since I'm the, the Kansas representative to the Southwest Power Pool, <laughs> I'll make a, an editorial comment here because Leo, I think your question was really important. Um, and, and I'm going to interpret it or reinterpret it here to say, you know, there's an interconnection cost when you, you connect up certain resources. But what we're seeing here is sometimes that interconnection cost may include, you know, voltage and reactive support, uh, power support technologies at the site. But sometimes those costs may get picked up in the larger planning process to support the, the entire grid. And, you know, depending on what sort of cost allocation you have in your region, they could just flow, they could be spread across the whole region. They may not flow to those particular generators that are hooking up. And I think that is that is a concern as we, I mean, we're going through Q reform right now. We're looking at the planning processes. We're reevaluating cost allocation. For instance, in SPP, we're considering something like a subscription model to just allow developers to, you know, here's the, the price per megawatt of your uh, resource type. And if you want to sign up, here's the cost to sign up. And I think you do have to keep in mind that there are going to be some of these supplemental technologies probably have to be added to the system um, you know, to, to support them, not necessarily at their point of interconnection. And we need to make sure we're compensating for that to the extent we're setting a subscription rate. So that's a question or a, a comment more than a, a, uh, <laughs> a question, but I, an editorial comment, I think it's worth making because I thought Leo asked a really good question there. Yeah. So no, I mean, can I just understand, Commissioner French, when you say of subscription rate, it would be like a postage stamp rate for that type of energy, regardless of what the actual costs are, that would include some of these additional needs. Is that what yeah? So, 
So we're in a really early state of, of talking about what it would look like. It certainly is going to have to go through a lot of channels, but just at a at an extremely high level, you know, typically today you do a an interconnection study and right. you define, you know, we, we do cluster studies actually right now to, to set here are the exact costs to interconnect um, this group of generators. Here's going to be their impact on the system. This is part of why the queues are so backed up is you you take forever <laughs> to do these studies and then people you know the costs come out higher than they expected and so then you do restudies because people pull out um so the big benefit of a subscription model is you try to project what the costs are going to be um to do interconnections and then you set that out there developers have cost certainty of here's going to be your price to interconnect probably with some variance uh, for the specifics of their project and then they know um, they can make an economic decision of whether they want to interconnect or not based on that cost. Um, but I think, you know, the point here is it's it is a you know, what is your cost to the system could be a, a, a pretty broad question because um, it may be one thing today. But if you have more and more projects coming online. Uh, eventually, you may trigger the need to add some of these new technologies to the grid. Um, and how do we compensate for that need or those upgrade costs um, if we're going to develop a one-time subscription rate to get them interconnected um, at the outset? So that that's yep. my, I hope I've put that in, in layman's okay. terms enough because that's all yeah. I'm capable of. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that that was a good summary and certainly eloquently put. And, uh, you know, something that, you know, you've seen as an example where people have proactively built transmission for renewables. So, for instance, in Texas, they had the CREZ development, which was advanced transmission build out. As part of that, they did put in some synchronous condensers. And that whole process was to allow for the eventual build out of a significant amount of wind power. <laughs> But at what point do you need to add all these additional things? Um, what megawatt, like, what if you have it, a small wind farm versus, I mean, small versus yeah. large, at what point are you doing this? It, it, it's very difficult to characterize that without, as uh, Commissioner French put it, doing studies. And okay. so hence the reason why, you know, there's this long process because it does require a lot of analysis to understand what must be done. Okay, thank you. Yep. So I, I know, one more, oh, one ahead, more quick question for me. Sorry, I, I should have thrown it in before, but it's just, you know, it's like nagging at me and I don't want to forget it. So, uh, you know, I, I think we've heard uh, about and are, you know, aware of the existence of some of these technologies, but, but I'm not personally aware of any of these, you know, like the fax devices. That was actually brand new to me. Um, are, do you, are, are any of these currently installed in, in, in SPP, for instance? I, I think SPP, but I don't believe in Kansas. So, mm -hmm. um, but uh, they are installed in, in a lot of different states and uh, we're seeing them more and more in particularly in states that have a significant amount of transmission congestion and a significant amount of renewable build in the works. Uh, so it, it's something I think you will be seeing in Kansas in the not too distant future. Yeah. So last quick thing. So, I mean, obviously the, the, the level of renewable penetration in Kansas is, you know, near record type levels, right? Depending on how you look at it. So have, have we been able to avoid these additional, you know, supplemental technologies today, primarily because of the existence of our, uh, conventional generation resources because of the inertia and, you know, the, the coal-fired, natural gas-fired power plants yes, really haven't been retired here yet. Correct. That's, that's the key? Correct. Oh, and okay. so it's just a factor of as you get additional renewable penetration, the level of these other supplemental technologies that are needed increases. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, well, I know a lot of my colleagues have some content they wanna get through. So I'm gonna just breeze through the slides and please stop me if you need to. Um, so just on the uh, voltage reactive power support, I did mention fax devices. 
Um, so statcoms is one of the technologies that you're going to increasingly see. And, uh, you know, uh, basically, again, we're seeing significant demand in the marketplace for uh, statcoms. Um, but, it, you know, it's a, again, we, we reviewed kind of what that technology is. So uh, what I'd like to do is advance to the next slide page. And this is my last slide. So, you know, really uh, regulation and contingency reserved. A couple things that I wanted to mention here. Um, you know, when it, we talked a lot about the electrical side of the equation, there's also the uh, capacity side of the equation, uh, the, the megawatts that are needed. And uh, there you're getting into situations where uh, long duration energy storage is certainly uh, becoming to be something we're seeing more and more of. Uh, Frank Jacob on the call will will go into that uh, in the future. Uh, also, you know what we're talking about here is I, I highlighted the replacement of of existing assets and the electrical impacts. Well, the capacity impacts are there, and it becomes at some point you still need that capacity. So carbon free uh, baseload power developments, which uh, one of our colleagues will talk about with nuclear also with alternate fuels that are carbon free. Um, you know, what we're seeing is uh, re reserve margins being reviewed and, and looked at it increasing because of this climactic variability that uh, I think we've seen in different interconnects. Uh, we talked about Texas earlier. Um, and then the other thing I would like to offer up is uh, maybe a potential for additional interregional bulk power transmission as a solution. So. I think one of the things that made the ERCOT situation in February of 2019 so difficult is their lack of any interconnection with another grid. So whenever their generation failed, uh, they had no ability to import power from neighboring interconnects. Well, a lot of the generation failures that happened in ERCOT also happened in SPP. And SPP imported a significant amount of power from MISO. And so I think, you know, what we need to be looking at here is additional interregional bulk power transmission, which I think we're all familiar probably with the Grain Belt project, which would envision a new HVDC link from Kansas into PJM that would allow the export of wind from Kansas into PJM, but also could allow the power flow of hydro, let's say from Canada, that's coming into PJM into Kansas. And, uh, you know, those can be insurance policies as, uh, you know, we have a grid which is more uh, reliant on climactic variables for the generation and its performance. And we have to recognize we live in a very large country. So the likelihood of a climate type event affecting the entire United States is very rare, unlike the United Kingdom. Uh, but, uh, you know, their interregional bulk power transmission can be a source of adding reliability and also allowing for the importation of renewable assets where it makes a whole lot of sense to build renewables. So th those would be just my last comments. Kevin, mm -hmm. I'll just add one comment on that. I'm really glad you brought that up because it's something I, I think about a lot is the transmission as a capacity resource um, concept that, you know, especially if you're relying on it as an insurance policy or, uh, you know, once in every several year contingency, you know, I think not that I have the answer or that we've done the analysis, but I think it's a fair question to ask, do you want to build a large power plant to cover that capacity need, or is it more cost effective for customers to build, you know, less costly, but, you know, difficult to maybe get built, but less costly transmission um, to be able to share from another area uh, capacity. So I I just I'm glad you raised it because I think that's a, a question that's going to need a lot of analysis in the next few years. All right. Well, appreciate the time again. And what I'd like to do now is uh, page pass the torch again here and appreciate your time. And uh, thanks a lot. Kevin, if I could, just a quick question. Um, you know, in my opening remarks, I talked about the timing of, you know, of the transition to renewables being slightly out of sync with the physics and, and everything else. And so you've talked about technology that uh, enables uh, the transition. How is the timing associated with that? How much of that is uh, of the uh, technology is going to have to be implemented out there as we continue this transition 
can we get there? You know, do we need to slow down the development of wind somehow or retirements in order to synchronize all of this? It's a great question. Um, and I don't know that I have uh, the answer. <laughs> I would say that I think, you know, right now we're on a on a path where, you know, there are transmission solutions to a lot of the renewables that are planned in the near term. Um, where we're going to have issues is as we get into renewable penetration to the level of, let's say, California, where, you know, all of a sudden you're starting to have additional, you know, requirements for battery energy storage, et cetera. So, you know, I, I know my colleagues are also going to talk about uh, developments in uh, nuclear, in advanced energy storage, in hydrogen, which are all ingredients, I think, that are part of the solution. and we have to recognize that it does take quite a long time to develop new technologies. Great, thank you, Kevin. All right, thank you. All right, I'm gonna pass things back to Wa. Hopefully she, yeah. she can uh, see. Can you see anything still? Yeah, <laughs> I can I can see it. Um, Paige, can you Yay. see the next one? Okay, all right. Um, so um, as we, talk about earlier, MISO has a lot of coal um, capacity. And I think right now there are 51 gigawatt of coal that's um, on average running at about 49% capacity factor. And we also check, um, keep track of the announcement by utilities and other operators and um, about the their plan for their uh, future coal uh, coal plants. And I think what we have identified is that between now and 2035, uh, we saw there like 28 gigawatt um, <clears throat> of the plants, more than half of the um, existing coal capacity uh, were slate to be retired um, in the next 15 years. And I think then is comes down to if you have that large amount of coal retirements, um, that's going to be um, slightly implemented in the next 10-15 um, year period, what are the solutions to replace them? And I think the, um, the issue with, um, with the co-retirement in such scale at MISO is that um, you cannot, um, we do um, expect certain portion of the capacity will be retired with renewable However, based on the discussions earlier, renewable um, generation are not dispatchable. It that does not come online on command. And I think it has to be backed up um, in order to um, make up for the intimacy um, and limited availability during certain hours. Um, so we see that a lot of other regions, um, their solution is that they have um, solar all wind, um, especially for solar, they typically um, really pair it with uh, battery so that um, you really have battery charging during the hours when the sun is shining. And I think then during the off hours when the sun is done, you probably just uh, dispatch the battery for, for discharge. Um, so that is one solution. However, and I think there are difficulties regarding fully replacing um, coal um, generation with uh, renewable pl or solar plus battery. Um, the issue is that we think um, it's going to be switching hours of, of um, uh, net energy peak requirements. I think then the battery, uh, the standard lithium ion battery has a short release of uh, energy release window and we also need to be charged. So you still need a solution when you have a couple of days where the sun is not shine, is not gonna shine. And I think then you cannot discharge, discharge your battery fully. So like Kevin and it, like touched upon earlier is that it needs a whole suite of energy solutions to be able to uh, rely, um, retire those coal units while still providing reliable service um, to the generation. I think combined, very efficient combined cycle natural gas is still a choice um, because it actually requires um, uh, less uh, fossil generation. I think uh, by design is also um, much cleaner um, than, than coal generation. And what we have done is just, we just really, have a, a relative like very cost calculation of how much 
um, combined cycle units uh, capacity will need in order to fully replace the 51 gigawatt of coal capacity. So that really comes down to about um, 31 gigawatt of new combined cycle units. And I think that is a tall order to really fully replace all of the 51 gigawatt with natural gas is nearly impossible, but that's just representative of the scale of um, capacity required to really um, eliminate coal from the generation portfolio. Um, next slide, please. Um, similar picture uh, with SPP. Um, SPP actually has about 24 gigawatt of coal capacity operating at a similarly 46% capacity factor. And um, I, I think, um, but the the um, the slight difference within SPP is that we have not noticed a lot of planned or announced capacity requirement um, in the uh, in the um, the ISO. The the issue is that we only see about four gigawatt of capacity um, co capacity announcement made for the next ten to fifteen year period. But the expectation is that with um, the region slightly catching up with more. Um, cleaner fuel um kind of requirement we see that some of the coal will be will be retired um um other than a, a higher retirement other than the four uh, gigawatt is going to be um is going to happen um so if we do the same ballpark calculation if we're retiring the entire 25 gigawatt of coal in spp that means that that means that you probably need 14 gigawatt of replacing a uh, new combined cycle capacity. Um, well, we, could I, could I ask you ahead. a question about that? I should have asked it on the MISO slide, but um, obviously it's significantly less capacity for a combined cycle fleet than coal. Is that, um, is that simply a reflection of the, you know, the flexibility that combined cycle might provide or is it a reflection of the heat rate and you know, the, the quality of its generation? What, what lends it to be um, less needing less gigawatts uh, for the same amount of reliability? Yes, we are actually just trying to replace the generation that's currently being produced, the electricity being produced by coal. So we really just say 24 gigawatt of coal operating at 46% capacity factor. We come up with a, a gigawatt hour number that need to be replaced. And assuming that if you build new combined cycle units, and I think they are more efficient, and the capacity factor is expected to be much higher, at we assumed 80% capacity factor for um for combined cycle units. Okay, that yeah. that helps me. So it's it's more of a simple calculation. Obviously, exactly. not not taking no. into account fuel <laughs> volatility or fuel availability. <laughs> right, right, right. And I think we after we put those numbers together, I said, okay, all right. Um, if you go like we look at the interconnection queue, nobody is proposing uh, combined cycle generation at, at the moment, not nearly to the scale of this. So we think it's going to be um. This is just a magnitude that needs to happen, but not necessarily need like really reflect that what's going to happen. Uh, next slide, Paige. Okay, all right. Um, uh, well, well uh, if you would yes. please, uh, before we move on from this comparison, this kind of contrast we have here between MISO and SPP, my, my question would be this. Um, <clears throat> I look at the most recent NERC reliability assessment reports mm -hmm. and what they anticipate even for the, the near term, the winter we're in now, maybe yet right. to experience. Right. Um, they give uh, passing grades, I'm, I'm, my, my vernacular, not yours. <laughs> they give <laughs> passing grades to SPP. They give near failing grades to MISO. And they're saying we've, in MISO, there is this high uh, reliability and resilience risk, is there not some relationship to that NERC conclusion and the pace at which this uh, renewable conversion is taking place within the MISO states? I would, uh, I haven't read the report, so um, I, I can't uh, really say for sure, but my speculation is you're right. Um, in the sense that if you look into the generation mix, MISO has a much larger um, 
concentration of wind capacity, and it had some it has experienced in the past some level of uh, curtailment and constraint on on some of for some of the wind generation capacity, and and in addition, um, I think um, with the really aggressive announcement and planned retirement for um, coal capacity. Um, if we look in the generation queue, there is not a very reliable answer to see if the coal is going to come off the generation fleet, what are the replacement units that can keep the same level of, of service reliability um, criteria. So I think um, part of the reason is that um, they have, they're a little bit more uh, progressive in terms of incorporating, decarbonizing, decarbonizing the, the generation fleet. Um, but I think um, they urgently need some uh, proposed solutions um, that's going to be, they need to go into all kinds of the, um, the, the solution toolbox to find out um, uh, kind of projects and investment to bring up the reliability um, kind of potentially a crisis um, in myself. Thank you so much for the candor of that answer and the uh, and the uh, holistic nature of your answer. I'm grateful for that because it strikes me as you're indicating here, they have these preordained goals uh, mm -hmm. to 2035. I mean, somebody picked that out of the air. They didn't. It seems to me pick it out of uh, any any uh, uh, analytical uh, assessment that said that the systems, all these systems that are going to have to provide for that result are gonna be in place by that time. So uh, yeah, it, it seems to me that that's probably not a template that SBP would wanna replicate. Yeah. Uh, well, one other question if I could, and this <laughs> may just be crazy. Is wind velocity, velocity affected at all by climate change? Has wind been affected? I mean, everything else is. Uh, I may not have the most technical answer to that, um, but I, there must be study regarding whether what whether the kind of the the wind um, um, velocity, all the production uh, profile could be affected by by climate change. Um, but I think um, for some of the situations like the crisis situations in ERCOT that we experienced is that um, during those really volatile or extreme weather conditions, a lot of things could happen that's going to be really exacerbate conditions potentially. I think that we need to be really prepared for the, um, the future events, uh, considering there may be um, really um, related consequences coming from as a result of climate change or what conditions could be more frequently accompanying um, some certain uh, kind of weather events. Well, and, and I would say this too, our extreme weather, more hot, more cold, whatever, while it used to be extreme, is going to be factoring in more into the norm. So I was thinking maybe not that one big storm Uri, but the everyday wind that blows weather studies show that it all is being affected, but that's for another day. Thank you. And I, <laughs> I, um, I know we're at approximately 1030 and we have a half hour to go. So, um, and also I am going to have to uh, depart. So Commissioner French, I've visited with you. If you will lead um, going forward, I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Black and Beach. This is so important to us and I know to staff, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Paige, okay, yeah, all right. <clears throat> so let's talk about um, the reliability of fuel supply to gas generators. Um, as we said earlier, um, if you retire coal um, generation capacity, I mean, the um, the most efficient, um, I would say the, the efficient replacement could be um, gas generation. However, um, gas generation is not 100% um, foolproof. 
Um, the difference being that if you are a coal facility and then you actually can really pile up the coal on the site so that you can actually uh, burn it and generate um, as you wish. Um, but natural gas, they transmit it until, um, 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 by natural gas pipelines from production basins to the, the, um, the generation site. And I think typically there is no storage kind of available on site. What happens is that you have to rely on the natural gas supply chain, all the system to work in order for coal to be delivered, um, to, for, for gas to be delivered to, for, for generation. So there were some issues is, is that the gas and uh, natural gas market functions fairly differently um, from the coal market of the, um, and also from the electricity market. So there may be disconnects and there could be disruptions on the supply chain in order to create reliability problems. So the natural gas market system works that you actually have producers who produce the gas and then sell them to, to somebody and then is transported on largely interstate pipeline system and um, to um, different end users. So there are two entities, two commodities here is that one is the natural gas as the commodity and the other is the transportation capacity that you need in order to move the gas to where you need to be. So in order to be able to guarantee that you have access to natural gas during hours where you require to generate, you need to hold firm both of those two elements. And well, unfortunately, both of the elements really functions differently against the, the requirement of power generation. So for power generation, more than likely you will try to see because power like natural gas generation, especially for some of the peaking units, you only generate when the wind and solar or something else is not there to meet the load. So typically is that you do not know when the generation will be dispatched beforehand. But in order to really kind of have firm access to gas when you actually need it, you need to firm up to say, I actually arranged to purchase such and such uh, amount of natural gas from somebody who owns the gas and also has arranged for the firm rights to transport those gas on the inter interstate pipeline system. Both of them need firm long-term commitments which could be against the power generators um, um, kind of profitability profile, if you will. So from that perspective, it is not, um, it's like typically for generators, we, we call as uh, merchant power generators. They basically dispatch at will and basically it's like at request of when the market needs them they will not, they will avoid to hold any firm contracts on, on either the gas commodity or the transportation capacity, just because they said, I'm going to only use it, uh, you own, I'm going to dispatch maybe, uh, let's say four hours a day, I'm not going to be able to sign up and uh, for firm capacity that's required me to really kind of holding those contracts and paying a, a fixed charge regardless of whether I'm using it. So um, it comes down to um, really how much uh, in order to firm up this natural gas generation when it's crucial to have that for the grid reliability purposes, it depends on how much um, you, you need to firm up. So I think the good news with SPP and MISO is that the market structure, the electric market structure is such that um, the generation um, is owned by utilities who actually also serve the load. They can plan for when some of the generators need to be dispatched and how much they will need in, to really avoid an absolutely catastrophic event um, to occur. And I think they can plan ahead to really um, sign up a small amount of insurance fuel capacity and then spread them across um, different rate payers to reduce the cost burden, uh, like to spread all the cost burden to 
uh, to a larger customer base. And that might be um, kind of like they need to balance in terms of what is the cost of firming up all the fuel supply versus what is the cost of potentially suffering through um, a, like a disruption event. And I think that's going to be a balancing act based on the characteristics and the service, um, the generation fleet um, of each um, utilities. But I think that's going to probably going to be need to be considered as really part of the um, the, the 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 going on ongoing kind of resource planning um, exercise. Just because I think this matter is going to become really um, uh, crucial as well as. Um, I mean, it's going to get worse um, in the long term based on the development trends. And we were talking about earlier about possible ways for, for the fuel generator to firm up for um, gas supply. I think there were um, several ways to do it. Uh, one is that you can actually just contact some third party natural gas marketer to say, I need my gas I, I'm going to have a contract with you. It's like a call option. Is that I need firm gas delivered to my um, my um, uh, plant gate um, at certain for certain hours a year, and then you just need to pay for for that contract. It's going to be regardless that if you have that contract signed, they're going to come up with the combination of how much natural gas uh, commodity they need to hold and how much pipeline capacity they need to hold so that it's going to be delivered to the door of the plant. And then the additional quest, the additional kind of um, issue could also be that um, you uh, contract with interstate pipeline companies, what they call, they, they offer no notice service. So that allows you to really draw upon the pipeline regardless. It basically is like you basically use the gas first, then they will ask you the question later. Um, so I, I think, but that is also a fairly expensive um, uh, service um, on some of the, uh, the gas pipelines. Uh, well, if I could ask you a question. Sure. Uh, this has been an incredibly eloquent presentation which, that you've given here. You have, uh, you have really hit so many important points and you have uh, tried to assist us in uh, thinking through some of the balancing propositions that are presented here with respect to the uh, utilization of gas. So I guess my question would be, and I'm not trying to have you repeat anything at all here, <laughs> uh, by, by, by having kind of built into the process, using the gas and coal to support the renewables uh, virtually day in and day out, does that create any inherent risk factors uh, when we have these peak needs that is, uh, uh, by not having, maybe using the, the, the dispatchables uh, uh, and having the renewables support them on occasion. Is, is, there, is there any kind of a downside to, to the approach that is being taken generally? Well, uh, Commissioner, I, I want to be, thank you for the kind words, and I want to be a little bit candid here. Um, it may not be kind of both well for a lot of the uh, the, the renewable um, uh, kind of mindset here. Um, but I think um, from a most economic perspective, um, the, the best way to go is to really try to say, I would like to decarbonizing my generation grid, but I don't want to suffer through a lot of the reliability issues that potential really disastrous consequence. I think one, um, solution, which typically is going to be people, when people talk about fossil generation, gas versus coal, gas, coal versus renewable, they pit them against each other and saying that coal and, and gas were bad and then uh, renewables, all of those were good. Um, I think there could be also a balancing act in terms that we expand as much renewable generation as possible in order to provide low carbon green energy um, in order to benefit our environment. But the, at the same time, what we need to do is hold some of the generation capacity available for coal and natural gas, but only dispatch them during the peak hours or during an unlikely event. So from that perspective, we are holding a lot of capacity that can be used 
but in reality, we are reducing the generation of them or actually using those capacity so that what we do is that we are not creating a really a big kind of pollution or emissions because we're not using them very, very um, kind of often. But it is still going to be one of the good, um, I mean, generation, I, I would say it's like, especially with natural gas, it's very efficient, very reliable. And um, if you hold some of those gas capacity and only dispatch them during the hours where renewables are not available, you are not exacerbating the environmental um, kind of frame like substantially while keep your reliability intact. But those could be, I mean, for some of the arguments, it could be um, politically incorrect, I would say. Well, I, uh, again, I mean, um, you've, uh, you've, 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 you've supplemented your, your, your um, eloquence with, uh, with your candor. And uh, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that very much. It strikes me that uh, as, a, um, as, as, as an amateur um, engineer, that is to say a non-engineer, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> it would sometimes be better if the solutions followed technology rather than tried to, uh, tried to lead it uh, prematurely. Yeah, and I think then the, I, I would just like say a little bit um, kind of good word for natural gas generation is also that um, um, we, we see the technology regarding um, kind of hydrogen generator, generators um, or um, ammonia generation. Uh, we think that could be the future of this. If you hold electricity, um, kind of natural gas generation that can be later switched off to um, those one of those um, zero carbon fuels, that's actually going to be, um, I think that really is a perfect, um, really, um, combination of reaching both the decarbonization goals as well as keep the system reliable. Thank you very much. Okay, um, any questions on this slide? Uh, I have uh, one just in terms of if you look forward strategically and coal keeps, uh, coal plants keep retiring uh, in rapid fashion and uh, while your slides have presented, we need less of gas combined cycle to replace the megawatts of coal. The question I have is, is there enough pipeline uh, transmission in place to support additional, the additional combined cycle plants that would be needed um, given the difficulty to, to build those, those any new transmission lines is the existing uh, infrastructure sufficient to, to actually deliver the gas to those combined cycle plants? I think the answer is yes. Um, the, um, it comes from two perspectives. One is that those new generators are fairly efficient. So to generate the same amount of electricity, they will need less, very less um, natural gas to, uh, to power it. So that is the first good news. The second good news is that um, natural gas production is very prolific in the U.S. So the two big basins, what we call the Marcellus Utica Shale in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio, they have a lot of gas that can be produced at fairly reasonable rate and can be um, really, um, if, if the market condition is, um, is conducive to the production, um, it can be produced very, very um, um, cheaply. I think on the second hand is on the, the, the second basin is the Permian Basin is the natural gas is actually a byproduct of oil production. So that would also means that the cost of production is fairly low. Um, the entire US has been having a fairly sophisticated and um, very kind of like uh, spread over um, natural gas transportation system that has a lot of pipelines coming from different places and reaching different places. And we think that um, some of the natural gas capacity because of the de decline in production um, in certain area, some of the pipelines were actually um, not, by not being utilized significantly. And I think if 
if um, th there should be pipeline capacity to be able to move those production from the spaces into it where it needs to go. So on this map, we show here, those were some of the key pipelines. A lot of those pipelines were currently not running kind of like very, very full just because we, we see that some of the production is not, um, is, is declining. And I think um, sufficient, uh, we, we would say that the pipes are in the ground to, to take on this role. Maybe um, small, kind of like small scale, um, uh, short distance expansion or upgrade and improvements may be needed, but by and large, um, kind of like at a high level, it appears to be sufficient. Great, thank you. Well, this is Leo. I have a question for you. I, you know, ramping up production is is difficult to do for immediate needs. Is there any look at? Have you looked at anything as far as um, LNG storage? You mentioned coal being stored on on site. Uh, is a possibility it keeps these plants dependable during extreme weather events. Mm -hmm. Would LNG also serve that role? I know they use it in the northern yes. states. Yes. Does that yes. make any kind of economic sense in the SPP area? Uh, well, depending on kind of what the assumptions of the future, um, maybe those events will likely to occur. Um, I know the, um, the peak shaving facilities are um, um, a fairly popular uh, to be used in by utilities in the northeast region, just because their they, their demand is having this really peak shape um, for a few days. They really need a lot of gas. I think by the same planning um, kind of um, uh, like principle, it may be um, it it could be a case to be made that for certain power plants, and I think that um, we need to be strategically placed some uh, on-site LNG facilities and to make sure that um, we prevent for the very unlikely, very um, kind of rare, but very um, a significant event of potential uh, supply disruption. Okay, thanks. You know, I, I see, you know, we're, we, we've got some chat room uh, information going here about uh, the time. Uh, I think staff is available to stay uh, Commissioner French, I know you indicated you are. Um, I want to be respectful of Black and Beach's time, though. So I, I know there's a comment to move the supply chain discussion to the end, which I'm fine with. But um, I think this is fantastic information. I'd love to keep going if, if Black and Beach has the time. But like I said, we want to be respectful of of, uh, of their time as well. Sure. And I hated to even mention it because I thought the conversation was so good. I didn't want to. Um, so I guess maybe let me check quickly. I'm available to stay. Let me check quickly with our team. Is there anyone that has an 11 that we should try to reorganize things? Um, or are our folks good to keep going? Uh, I'm, I should be good. Okay. Paige, I will have to drop. Um, this is Mark Gakey. Okay. Well, let's move. If you guys are okay with it, if we're good with keep going, can we just rearrange a little bit um, to accommodate folks' schedules and then it may, um, we can Perfect. shoot back. Okay. So Mark, I'm going to move to your stuff. And then Aaron, if you're available to stay on, we'll come back to your stuff. Yes, I am. Awesome. Okay. So Mark, uh, if it works for you, you're up. Great. Uh, so thank you uh, for your interest today and definitely appreciate the opportunity to discuss. Uh, my name is Mark Gakey. I'm the Nuclear Technology Manager for Black & Beach. been with Black & Beach for 31 years. And we're going to talk about SMRs and I'll, I'll run through this relatively quickly so we can get to some of the other slides. Um, new nuclear is getting a third look within the industry. Um, the large plants that were proposed back in the early 2000s didn't get built. A lot of that was due to the gas market. Uh, so the gas prices were extremely low and that didn't enable a large build out of large nuclear plants. And, um, but what we're seeing today is that there is a lot of renewed interest, both from a decarbonization perspective, as well as energy security. And that's not just in the US, but that's around the world. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of growth, uh, not only in North America, but in Asia, as well as in Europe for those reasons. Uh, the US government is actually providing a lot of funding right now to encourage new technology. Uh, 
They're doing that through a variety of approaches. So DOE has initiated technology awards, as well as two large ARDP demonstration project awards. Uh, in addition to the infrastructure bill providing funding, the recent uh, Inflation Reduction Act provided additional credits that's not only for existing generation assets, so existing nuclear plants like Wolf Creek, but also for new plants that will come online um, after 2025, have the ability to either get uh, an investment tax credit or a production credit. Uh, so there is a lot of momentum building and a lot of utilities are currently looking at this option, you know, not for immediate uh, deployment, but really for, you know, 2028 and beyond. If you go to the next slide. So in the U.S., what we're seeing is subsequent license renewal for many plants. Uh, SLR is really taking a plant that was originally designed for 40-year life um, out to 80 years. Uh, most of those plants have already gotten one license extension to go to 60 years, uh, but we're seeing many plants uh, getting the process in place to go to 80 years. Um, Vogel uh, is the large uh, light water reactor plant based upon the AP1000 technology that was built in Georgia. That will likely be the last large light water reactor plant built in the U.S. Uh, the utilities are favoring the small modular reactors going forward. And what we're seeing is that a lot of utilities are, as they're updating their IRPs, are looking at the potential of SMRs to fill in that carbon-free energy gap that they're seeing in their IRPs beyond 2030. And so what are the utilities doing today? A lot of utilities are looking at various siting and technology studies. Uh, we've assisted several, uh, both on the East Coast as well as uh, in the upper Midwest. Um, NPPD just recently announced a study to look at 15 different sites, and a lot of that is looking at coal replacements uh, through their territory uh, in Nebraska. We're also starting to see a lot of non-nuclear utility interest in SMR technology. Uh, Dow Chemical was one of the recent ones that announced that they were pursuing new nuclear to meet their growing needs uh, for decarbonization as well as increased load. And in, you know, some of the issues that we talked about earlier today, both inertia as well as having uh, fuel on site, right? Nuclear is able to do both. Uh, so nuclear provides both inertia as well as having fuel on site. So when we load fuel into a nuclear reactor, um, we typically have fuel available for 18 months. Uh, so that is an, an added, another benefit of new nuclear technology. Um, some of the SMRs will actually be able to um, operate for five years before refueling. Um, that won't be in the initial um, fuel loads that they'll do, but they'll be able to transition to that as they go forward. And then as we look at the future, um, you know, we, we're looking at a variety of different technologies. So Black & Beach is involved in all technologies. And so when we're looking at coal replacements and we're looking at the uncertainty of hydrogen build-outs and, and some of the issues with renewables that we've talked about. We're not saying that nuclear is the answer, but we think it's part of the answer for the future, especially beyond 2030. Next slide. So just to kind of ground everybody, there's really two different types of technology for SMRs. So we have generation three plus technology, which is light water reactor uh, moderated plants. That's all technology that's well understood. It's in the current operating fleet and both BWR and PWR options. So that's a boiling water reactor and a pressurized water reactor. Um, the Gen 3 plus plants, the plus designation indicates that it has passive safety features. Uh, so that's a benefit for the overall, um, not only reliability, but also safety of the plant. Um, they all use conventional fuel. So that fuel is available today. And so these plants could be deployed um, as early as 2028. Um, we're working with OPG in Canada for the first uh, BWRX 300 deployment. Uh, TVA is also looking at building a number of BWRX 300 plants. Um, and so there's a lot of work currently going on in this space. 
On the Gen 4 side, um, so Gen 4 plants don't use light water reactor moderators. They use a variety of different technologies. And there's a variety of different technologies in the Gen 4 category. Um, but there are some advantages to this going forward. Higher temperatures uh, for better efficiency and process heat. Um, different types of fuel, uh, including some that have a ceramic coating and a silicon dioxide coating that provide additional uh, high temperature heat tolerance. And there's a variety of uh, manufacturers or vendors in the reactor space that are developing these technologies today. So as we look to the future, there's definitely a lot of potential in the 2030 and beyond timeframe for new nuclear. Um, the one challenge that's still out there is to demonstrate the cost and schedule certainty for new nuclear, just as it is with any new technology. Um, so that challenge is one that we're currently addressing um, as we work with clients like OPG, TVA, and others. And so what we're looking at is how we bring these to market in the most economical way possible. If you go to the next slide page. One thing that will be true for the future is that um, plants today are very large, uh, very remotely located. In the future, we'll be able to more distribute um, the plants closer to the loads and closer to um, cities as well. Uh, because the EPZ or the emergency planning zone is so much smaller on the new SMRs, um, we'll be able to integrate some of these SMRs directly with renewables. Uh, some of the SMRs like TerraPower's Natrium Solution is actually designed to integrate with renewables. So it has a salt storage capacity that allows it to ramp up and down to provide some augmented capacity output. Uh, so there's a lot that's being done to help integrate these plants into the future of the electricity market. And Paige, that's my last slide, so I'll let you continue. Thanks, Mark. If I could ask, uh, Mark, if yeah. I could ask a question of Mark, sure. please. You bet. Uh, outstanding presentation, Mark. Great overview for us, for sure, for sure. Um, I've got two questions. The first is, uh, I, I, I'm looking back. We need not turn there, but back on slide 32, uh, you had indicated, I think, that uh, that of course there's there's funding coming out of the infrastructure bill to help uh, fund some of this uh, operations. The bottom line there. Uh, my question really is this, uh, relating to uh, government oversight or intervention here. From what I have heard anecdotally, maybe it's incorrect. If it is, you correct me. That one of the downsides right now to nuclear is the I'm going to use my terminology and you can correct it as well, is the over-regulation, the absolutely over-regulation of, 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 of the construction of new nuclear facilities that in itself creates so many cost barriers to, uh, to entry. Uh, anything to that? Certainly there is. Um, so regulation in and of itself is, is good. Um, over-regulation, as you understand, is, is not good. Um, so there are licensing applications that are uh, currently being developed for these new plants. Um, and there's still some uncertainty with how the NRC will view some of those, especially for the newer Gen 4 technology. Um, in addition, a lot of these plants, the initial SMRs will be built under the old licensing process, which is called the Part 50 process, versus the newer process, which is Part 52, which is what Vogel did. Um, and so you're, you're very right in the sense that I think we have to be cautious about cost and schedule certainty with a regulator that may be overly intrusive and to a point where even the regulator may not understand how to regulate a Part 50 plant in what has been a Part 52 experience over the last, say, 10 to 15 years. So there will be challenges ahead for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, my, my other question is, um, how, how does nuclear compare in this uh, small uh, modular framework you're talking about here on a cost benefit analysis to renewables? So still, still higher. I mean, especially initial capital cost is higher. The levelized cost of electricity is really not as high. Um, so there are benefits 
you know, especially when you look at these plants are, you know, essentially designed for 60 years, will likely be operated for 80 years. Um, so there are benefits to that, especially when you're looking at LCOE costs. Um, but you're looking at, you know, somewhere in the, you know, $2 billion range versus what you would typically see for, you know, a, a combined cycle plant or a solar plant, obviously being much cheaper from a capital cost perspective. So capital cost is still going to be a large um, hurdle for utilities or independent power producers to accommodate. So it's the regulated utilities that are going to be moving first. And, you know, that that's really what we're seeing right now. Thank you very much, Mark. Great overview. All right. Any other questions for Mark? I know he has to hop off. Okay. Thanks, Mark. All right. Is everyone else on the black and beach end? Okay. Can we go back to where we were or does anyone else have a schedule? Hey Paige, I send you a message here and, and Sorry, I, can't. I, I have to drop it top of the hour. Okay. This is our go to you. Frank, we'll come right back to you. Sorry if I'm making you guys sick. <laughs> I apologize. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, I'll just briefly go here and, and cover carbon capture. This is quite a topic and can be its own workshop, usually with my own clients. So um, I'll, I'll cover as best as I can. But one thing here from this slide is just to show that it's happening. There is a huge pipeline of projects given current conditions all across the world. You know, in, in the U.S. having the uh, uh, 45Q and the updated 45Qs through the IRA is, is really uh, given quite quite the energy behind those projects that were already kind of barely there economically to make it and now uh, they either breaking even or even um, uh, making uh, bringing in some value. You know, Canada, we have uh, projects in Canada uh, that are also advancing quite well and we're seeing the Canada market because of the carbon tax really driving this. You know, I won't cover anything on the rest of, of the world here because everybody got their own goals, but. They're all driving towards this regulatory carbon tax slash uh, uh, incentive base uh, programs that each of the countries are trying to uh, incorporate. Next slide, please. Just a just a high level overview. Uh, there's a lot here to uh, to look at, but um, the technologies that you may be hearing or are in the news or, or everybody's talking about is the commercial technologies that are post combustion. There are pre-combustion technologies. Those are the ones that you may hear on the basis of blue hydrogen or ammonia, things like that uh, use a pre-combustion type process it's because the CO2 concentrations are high. Uh, from a utility perspective, we basically, you're not with our client, only look at post-combustion technologies because we're talking about removing the CO2 from uh, the emissions uh, from the flue gas. So, Higher CO2 concentration, cheaper the cost, cheaper capture, uh, lower, uh, lower cost, just because of the sizing and the chemistry that goes behind that. Um, you know, the, the efficiencies have improved. Uh, in the past, you would hear that they would get 80%, and that's what it used to be done with the generic um, technologies, which is a solvent-based technology. And now we're looking into these proprietary technologies that have advanced, and they're reaching up to 95% capture efficiencies. Some, some are claiming even higher. Uh, next one, please. Um, this is just a value chain. Uh, this is something that I like to cover because when we speak technology, that's just one part of this whole entire project. These are complicated projects requiring all these pieces and parts to go together and align as well on capacity, economics, uh, uh, footprint, land uh, uh, availability. Uh, but you have to start with a man in mind because if you don't have a way to store or utilize the CO2 in the scale that we're talking about and these projects are based on, then it makes all the upstream um, steps here much more challenging. Next, next slide, please. Um, won't cover this much. This is technical, but the DOE has done a lot of the work here to really help the R&D and develop these technologies. So is a breakdown of how these technologies are done. This came from their uh, R&D program, this, this picture that describes how they separate in the different applications, just like I covered earlier between post and pre-combustion. 
membranes are coming along, uh, they're emerging, and there's a lot there still on the R&D side. Uh, one thing here on the slide here, I want to cover the last bullet point. Um, the commercial technology, even the ones that are coming up here, which is absorbent absorption, they all require some quantity of uh, steam, power, and water, just because of how the chemistry and the process is, is, is done to date. Uh, they all vary in, in size and capacity and quality of these utilities, but they all kind of need that. So usually uh, you have to think of carbon capture as non uh, energy generating type process. Some people um, think of it as, as generating something that's actually consuming energy in the process. Next one, please. Um, I won't go over these. These, these will be uh, some of the challenges that face the technologies, current technology, but then there's a lot of work being done here to de-risk these through proper planning and design, but some of it is technology risk. Some of it's project risk. Uh, there have been enough done now in the last 10, 15 years and really basing uh, the concepts from technology they use CO2 separation or gas separation in process plants from 30 years ago. So all that knowledge is there. Um, the lessons learned are there. And, and now it's about de-risking the projects that are in the pipeline. And, and so these are some of the knowledge and things that we look at. Next one. Page. Um, here, this is just, just something technical, but uh, just to point out how they integrate to an existing power plant. So uh, kind of where we see the demonstration of how it is improved is, is it can now, this technology can be applied now to lower concentrations of flue gas. In the past, that was, that was kind of one of the no-go areas. Uh, we are starting to see higher volumes, higher capacity trains, from the process perspective, you can, some of these projects are capturing three plus million tons annually. Um, the, the loads are starting to get uh, better in terms of the energy requirements, and they'll vary by the process and the technology you take, integrate. And then uh, there is these next gen solvents that are helping better perform, and that, that usually relates to lower, co uh, lower cost. Um, so I think we're getting a lot of alignment here between the industries and the OEMs, and then, and then the economies of scale are, are helping. So when you hear a dollar per ton type of number, uh, that's key because the bigger the, the project, the more CO2 you can capture, the better that dollar per ton, that levelized cost looks and is. So, so it has to be kind of looked in the context of how you're levelizing it and the size of the project. Next slide, please. And I think this may be the last one. Uh, so really just to give you just a, a rough look at where we are from the point source carbon capture, this post combustion. So passing current and long-term costs here, we're starting to, to start to kind of blend. We used to see the passing current in that range uh, and it's starting to get closer to, to the lower end than, than it is. And like I said, the economies of scale are doing a lot to it. The alignment with the OEMs, uh, the uh, the de-risking of the projects, they are bringing these costs down. Long-term costs are, are, are kind of what the, the technology providers are trying to aim for. Uh, they're in the process of doing that, but uh, we believe that that's going to take another round of, of, of technology iteration or evolvement or development to get to those numbers. But now with the IRA being much higher than it used to be, where it was $50 per ton, uh, that, that those efforts are still ongoing, but, but at the end of the day, it may not make a huge difference on, uh, on the overall project cost. Um, some of the outlook, I, I kind of mentioned at the beginning there with the map, uh, really um, seeing that a lot globally and, and oil and gas industries are taking a lead leadership on this. It, it, it's, it's allowing their energy transition. Uh, same thing with the power industry, uh, the ones that are located near sequestration sites, are moving on with these projects they've had or contemplated for, for, for a few years now because of that increased 45Q tax incentives. And some of the states we're doing work at, and then we're seeing a lot of movements and the signposts are, you know, Alberta, Canada, Texas, Wyoming, and Louisiana. Um, and then, you know, one thing to think about the 45Q legislation is that's always had a bipartisan support. And the belief is, is that we'll continue uh, even in the next few generations to come. And, and that, that speaks highly for the 45 feet tax incentives to remain and, and extend. And I think that's all I have, Paige. So um, sorry for running quickly through these slides and 
and not taking the proper time, but, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions you may have or anything in these slides or what I mentioned that uh, may have um, uh, sparked a question or I'll go from my perspective. I just want to thank you for being here. I know you have to run. And so I think we're going to let you run. Um, but I agree that this could be its own, uh, its own workshop in and of itself. I expect, you know, if we see this becoming relevant in Kansas in the next couple of years, we, we may, we may call on you to, to have some questions and, and maybe do another workshop. Sounds good. Glad to, to do so. Thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks. Your and um, Jeff has a copy of these slides. And if, you know, anyone generates questions on these afterwards, you can just right. shoot them to me and I'll distribute them out to the group. So we'll make sure that you get um, answers back to them. Thanks, Paige. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Nagar. Appreciate it. All right. So, um, let me get it. Aaron, if it's okay, I think I will put you at the end since we're kind of into yep, that's um, fine. technologies. Thanks for sticking with us. So, uh, Frank, um, would you be able to go through your um, items now? Are you able to see the slides? I can see the slides. Can you hear okay. me? Yes. Look at that. Success. All right. And um, Paige, I'm going to rely on you because I use animation to keep yep, yep, myself on track and Tell so me when to hit the button and i'll do it for you uh, I'll, I'll say next each time make, make it Sounds easy perfect. all right next oh well let me introduce myself um why don't we go back uh frank jacob uh been at black and veach for seven years now uh 30 years before that in advanced uh, energy research product development deployment testing uh, I did work with um, uh, many of the national labs as part of that work, uh, bringing their tech scientific solutions to solving commercial problems. And um, towards the end of my career, I wanted to get full time into renewable energy. And Tom Phillips at Black and Beach offered me a job in renewable energy in 2016, and I've been here ever since. He wanted me to come in and add energy storage to wind and solar and make them firm, dispatchable generation. And uh, we've been doing that here ever since. Next slide. Um, energy storage solutions. Think about them in the past. Pumped hydroelectric. Still, over 90% of all the storage on the grid today here in the States is pumped hydro. We've been putting in lots of other technologies, mostly lithium ion. But at the end of the day, it's only a small amount compared to all of the pumped hydro that we put in over the past century. Next. Uh, present solution is lithium ion batteries. Uh, their primary use case is, is sh either short, less than an hour, to do some of these ancillary services that Kevin was talking about, uh, frequency regulation, frequency reserves, primary, secondary, tertiary frequency reserves. And there's one form of battery, lithium titanium battery, that is best for power applications like that. And for medium durations of, of an hour or two, maybe up to four, and soon up to eight hours, um, those we are we're smoothing solar, we're time shifting solar and wind, uh, we're taking variable renewable generation and making them more available more of the time. Uh, next. In the future, the term long duration energy storage, LDES, has come around. You'll be seeing that in publications and literature. Uh, its primary use case is much longer duration, longer than lithium ion, longer than pumped hydro. Uh, uh, if not a half day, a full day, two days, there's one company uh, working on a week's worth of battery energy storage. And uh, we're working with them in some of their deployments uh, that are going in uh, this still this year. Next slide. Uh, storage is not new. Uh, it's not new to the region. Oh, uh, Ten years ago, uh, KCPNL, then named KCPNL, uh, they had a smart grid project. It was um, co-funded by the department, federal agencies through the infrastructure bill of 2009, if you remember that. And um, 
uh, over the years, uh, uh, look at those numbers there. Uh, uh, 12 years ago, an hour of storage would have cost well over $1,000 for one kilowatt worth. Um, five years later, it was half that. Uh, just in 2020, it was half that again. Next. And today, it's around $200 per kilowatt for one hour of storage. And I, I say that deliberately because if you want two hours, you're going to buy two batteries and you'll pay $400. If you want four hours, you can buy four batteries and you're going to spend $800. So uh, e energy storage isn't um, uh, uh, inexpensive, but it's of high value for some of these services that renewables need. Next. Uh, in future years, five years from now, it's expected to be less than $100 a kilowatt for one hour and five years after that, under $75 per kilowatt. And uh, next. So um, a, a simple life cycle cost, if you look at what energy is gonna cost, and uh, storage is gonna cost in the future and you divide it by the number of hours it's gonna operate each day over a 20 year life, it's adding about one cent to the cost of the electricity being produced. And um, it, it's normally less than that because you don't put the same amount of power for storage as you do with the wind. You put in some lesser amount, uh, half the power, quarter of the power. So uh, for instance, Next Era is on, on record saying that uh, beyond 2023, all new solar fields of there are, is going to have uh, energy storage and that'll add less than a, a half of a cent uh, to the power produced by those uh, solar solar farms. Next. So what's all the buzz about energy storage? Next. Well, energy storage is as inexpensive as ever, as we just talked through. Uh, the storage part uh, is less than 20% of what it was 10 years ago. So that's what's been enabling everything you hear about electric vehicles. That's why Super Bowl commercials are going to show Ford trucks while the Chiefs are playing in the Super Bowl this year. Um, but uh, energy storage is not cheap. So sizing and optimization is an important element of the facility design. Next. Lithium ion battery cells, the same ones used in our mobile devices and electric vehicles, uh, the same shaped cells. Uh, the, those are the ones being produced by the tens and hundreds of gigawatt hours. About 5% of those cells come to stationary energy storage today. So the transportation industry is really the big dog in the business for batteries, but stationary energy storage is a recognizable um, subset and, and companies are complying with requirements for stationary that are different than transportation. Next, Frank, time. if I could ask a question about this slide. Um, one thing we are hearing, I, I see here you say that they use the same shaped cells um, for stationary storage as for you know, what EVs may use, for instance. Um, but, you know, I, I know the question has been raised, well, gosh, is there enough lithium or is there enough, uh, you know, of the, the rare earth minerals to uh, have these sources compete with EVs? And I think the answer I've heard is actually that, you know, the chemistry is, is kind of evolving and we're using different, uh, perhaps different, uh, components than some of the EVs are. Can you talk just a little bit about that and whether there is competition for the same minerals or if they are um, you know, evolving? I think you mentioned maybe the longer term storage is not so much relying on lithium ion uh, right. batteries. Um, right. Could you just talk a little bit about that and you know what whether there is competition or whether there are some assurances that um, maybe we're using a little different things and, and competition, should it not be as much our concern? Uh, Competition is always a concern in world markets. Um, Aaron, Aaron could help uh, talk about that uh, at the later session. And uh, I, I will say that when it comes to lithium, two things. There's as much lithium in the Earth's crust as there is zinc and iron and tin. And we've never worried about running out of those things. What we got to learn how to do is recycle from the batteries that we are putting out there at the end of their lives and, and start getting that extra stream. Uh, so it is earth abundant. Uh, it's being mined where it was easy and where it was easy is in some domains where 
There are uh, uh, political elements that uh, uh, kind of affect the justness of the supply chain. So there's a lot of effort to, to squeeze out those rare earth uh, minerals from the chemistries. For, for stationary, something called lithium iron phosphate is being used um, in, 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 because it, it, it's the chemistry used in buses. It's great for kind of uh, slow, um, deliberate uh, use cases. Uh, a lithium with uh, nickel, Manganese and cobalt are used in electric vehicles so that they could accelerate and they have all the power you need and do the other things. So uh, when it comes to stationary storage, there there is a little a lack of competition because lithium iron phosphate it is uh, good for buses and it's good for stationary and probably half is going to each of those markets right now. So when you peel back the layers on, on what do you mean by lithium, uh, it doesn't look very bad for stationary storage going forward. Thank you. Um, and, and we're talking about the IRA and all the tax credits and direct pay options that are coming out that are going to enable standalone storage being now eligible for such things. Next. Uh, there are issues. I can't hide them. Safety, lifetime, decommissioning, repurposing, recycling. They're being addressed. They're being addressed by big national and international programs. They're not solved yet. Uh, but then this technology is uh, only now emerging out onto the grid to really start uh, putting our shoulders behind that and making it happen. Next. Um, this is a picture of, of where do you put storage on the grid? Every, every place you see a little green dot is generation. Every p place you see a little blue dot is transmission and distribution. And everywhere you see an orange dot is where you can place, uh, co-locate storage with those assets and make them better. Um, you know, on the food shows, they say uh, everything's better with bacon. Well, on the grid, everything's better with batteries. It helps uh, smooth out solar and renewables. Uh, it helps uh, peak load shaving in at industries and facilities. And you'll note some places there are little there are paradots because that's everywhere a location has an electric vehicle as well. And one of the future uh, thoughts around electric vehicles is that they would become a grid charging discharging asset. Uh, in the future, and uh, uh, there's some complex economics that have to be uh, worked out for all of that. But the volume of electric vehicles out there will be uh, uh, exceed by a hundred or a thousand times the volume of stationary storage we're putting deliberately in. So uh, the EV electric vehicle infrastructure are are looking at ways to tap into that uh, kind of available resource. Another quick question on this, um, you know, I, I think a lot about uh, energy storage and, you know, utility scale storage versus, you know, what you've laid out here, which is, um, you know, perhaps residential uh, storage and on yes. the residential side paired with distributed generation or, or EVs. Um, and the, it seems to me there's this sort of trade off of uh, yeah. It seems very cost effective to put it on a large utility scale application, but on the other side, it seems like you've got an enormous resiliency benefit of having it distributed across the grid, um, yes. perhaps at, at uh, residential sites. Um, I, I guess, you know, I, am I thinking about that right? Are there, you know, should there be, you know, how do you think about the costs and benefits of those two different applications? And whether there should be policies that encourage one or the other, maybe that's a <laughs> an unanswerable question with lots of different trade offs. But I'd be curious if you just have any thoughts on the on sort of the the pros and cons of each. Uh, there's there's going to be batteries in homes. Uh, uh, Tesla and LG and Samsung make 10 kilowatt devices that you buy. I mean, you're going to be buying a battery for your house the way you buy a a, a tank water heater for your house. Uh, so that, uh, you know, you don't have to run a 200 amp service to do instantaneous water heating. You put it in a tank and it, it stores the energy for, for when you need it later or, or it will store your rooftop solar or it'll give your house resiliency. Um, you cer we certainly don't want our, our TV and, and Internet to go down during the Super Bowl game we'll be playing in three weeks from now. Right. Uh, 
Um, policy needs to improve. Uh, there are tax credits for that, preparing storage with uh, with solar on uh, at residences and and uh, commercial buildings. So uh, it's it it's not solved, but it's been solvable in other areas. And and if we get behind it in the right way, appropriate to the needs of each region, um, I I think it'll be solved. Thank you. Uh, Frank, if we, could, if we could go back just very briefly to uh, uh, the question that Commissioner French had asked earlier about the rare earth minerals and all right. the, the kinds of minerals that are required for all of these batteries, prospectively. Uh, what, what are the major sources of supply? Uh, what, what countries? Where do, where, do we, where do we find these rare earths? Well, for cobalt, uh, it's the Congo, and it's uh, uh, the areas of Africa where there's uh, child labor and other things going on. So, um, uh, you know, these batteries were invented in the 1960s. Uh, they weren't commercialized till the 1990s. They were put on the grid in the 2010s, and and they've hit the inflection point because uh, they're low enough cost and the needs there for them. But uh, uh, these uh, say um, socio-economic political issues do need to be addressed. And, and uh, they are being addressed by developers looking to make uh, batteries as simple as, as, as from iron and air. I mean, what, what two more abundant materials do we have than that? And their battery cells could each store 100 hours worth of stored energy. And so that could give, say, a, 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 uh, a street in a neighborhood enough energy to get through a uh, the next derecho that comes in and knocks down all of the um, um, power lines and they need to be rebuilt. Uh, so I, I have a lot of hope for all that, uh, more hope than ever with all of the um, uh, federal support uh, behind building out that infrastructure and, and the numerous developers that are looking at zinc-based batteries or, or uh, sodium-based batteries or, or salt-based batteries. Kind of major source of supply for these rare earths. Um, I, I might defer to uh, uh, the speaker who will be talking about the supply chain later on. Did you ask if China was? Yes. Yes, and even in the example of cobalt, it, I believe a lot of that that's mined from the Congo is then processed and eventually uh, finished in China as well. So uh, if not even sourced from China, a lot of times the actual production occurs in China okay. currently. <laughs> I think, Aaron, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I think I'd heard anecdotally that uh, China is trying to have a major influence on the uh, min many of these uh, kinds of rare earths in the Congo. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, when you mean by influence, is just the, the use of it or the actual conditions there? Or what do you mean by the influence? Con ownership and control. Yes. Yes, That that is, the, they do have a... a vested interest in, in control and ownership of that mining process. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're not wrong to, to see the connection there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes. And I'd also heard that Afghanistan was a source of some of these as well. Is that correct? These rare earths? Yeah, it, it is. Um, and, and to be honest, and you, same thing with polysilicon, you're, you're going to find sources of these common materials um, throughout, spread throughout the world, but the question is, you know, where in concentration? Exactly. And, and, or, and so, yes, you, you do find um, cobalt spread throughout the, the world, but to Frank's point, majority of the mining historically has been in the Congo region. Yeah. And the main reason for my question is just to, at least looking, looking down the chessboard of life up a bit, uh, what level of vulnerability does that really create prospectively? That's right. really what, what I'm hitting at. So uh, one thing, theme, uh, Hua mentioned it, the other speakers uh, uh, did mention it, uh, other, others may not have, but, but will in the future, it, is that uh, uh, our Black and Beach, when we look at the grid, it requires diversification of, of supply, diversification of equipment. Um, you don't want to uh, become overly dependent on, uh, you know, one uh, transmission cable manufacturer in the world who somehow managed to get a low price with low labor costs. So uh, uh, we're watching out for all that. Complex question. Let's finish up. Next slide. 
uh, the, the LDES, uh, long duration storage. Uh, you could think of ways to store heat thermally. I, there's one developer we're working with right now that's going to take renewable electricity, use it to melt salt, molten salt, stored at 500 degrees C. And at the same time, they were doing that through a thermodynamic cycle. They're going to make something really cold, like meth, liquid methanol at mi minus 100 degrees C. Now you've got a temperature difference over which you could run a thermodynamic cycle. And uh, they're designing a 100 megawatt uh, replacement for coal plants that would use electricity, store 10 hours worth of heat, and then be able to deliver that electricity back to the grid. So that's number one up there. We could use thermal energy in that way. So those solar power towers you've seen in the desert, they were shining mirrors on some vessel way up high. That was a molten salt vessel. They were melting salt. So it's abundant, it's cheap, it's uh, easy to use, and we know its properties. So it, it, it's a lot of these new technologies are using um, abundant, earth abundant, low cost uh, materials and, and systems that and components that have been used in the past. They're not inventing new things to do this. Uh, there are mechanical ways to uh, st uh, store. Um, like I've said, pumped hydro, we've been doing it all, all the time. A new company is looking at subsurface pumped hydro, where they will take water, pump it into the uh, granite of the earth at high pressure, and then it'll squirt back up to the surface through turbines to uh, uh, re reuse that stored energy. Uh, in, in the lower left are those batteries that I've been talking about. Uh, I, watch for iron air batteries. Watch for the wide variety of zinc batteries that could be used for data centers, replacement um, for, for UPS systems. And, and batteries are by nature modular. So, you, you know, you build one and you, uh, you, you put hundreds of them in an electric vehicle. You put tens of thousands of them at a uh, solar facility, or you put uh, 100,000 of them at a, at a transmission substation. Uh, next. Uh, so abundant, low cost, iron salt, water, air. Next. Uh, proven conventional equipment, I mentioned that. And finally, uh, cost targets, this is important, are looking to be 10 to 100 times less than batteries. You know, I spoke that batteries may get to $75 for one hour of storage um, for lithium ion. Uh, some suppliers are looking at 75 cents for their materials. And um, it, it on, on paper, on concept, uh, it, it works out. The uh, venture firms that are investing in these firms, uh, you know, do the financials far better than anybody else, and they're investing in these firms. So um, I can't tell you which one is going to win, but several will, and we'll have solutions for the grid. Next. All right. Uh, the secrets, reliability, resiliency, adequacy, and flexibility. Any more questions on storage? Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. All right, did Albert. Brian, you still here? Still with us? I am. Awesome. Thank still you. <laughs> <laughs> so, good morning. You're um, waiting. <clears throat> yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I'm Brian Mendel. I'm, I'm our director of hydrogen and ammonia solutions at Black and Beach. I've been at Black and Beach almost 23 years, kind of been all over the organization. Um, today, I think what I'm was asked to talk about was specifically kind of hydrogen combustion turbine availability and some of the economic factors around that. Um, I'm going to start with the punchline there at the bottom that pure hydrogen combustion turbines are fuel supply limited today. Um, there are a lot of caveats to that. Um, I, the suppliers of those turbines know that there, there isn't enough hydrogen supply available today to even get to 50% hydrogen blend in a turbine. And that's what most of what they can handle today is. So they can kind of make that statement that they are so, and that is a, a true statement. 
Um, there are a few other examples like the GE arrows that can take close to 100% today, but you have to use an old diffusion flame combustor and, and a heavy water injection. So there are some nuances there if you, if you really want to do something like that. And then the rest of the models and other manufacturers um, know that they will be ready prior to enough hydrogen to be available to support 100%, which, which we expect right now to be before 2030, around 2030 or slightly before. So they'll, they'll be all ready to go before then. Um, so in terms of the economics around a lot of that, um, and, and I think it was right to be pointed out as the question to be answered is the economic factors around distribution and storage. And that this is something that when we talk with clients, um, it's something that nobody really thinks about until you start getting into it and running the numbers. And this is a huge potential cost lever on these projects that a lot of times make them uneconomical. So, um, as you probably know, the, the gas, the hydrogen gas distribution network, whether that be repurposing natural gas pipelines or putting in dedicated hydrogen pipelines in the right of ways of the gas of the natural gas pipelines today isn't isn't up and running. We expect that to be in the next five or ten years. So because that's not available and and the, the large amounts of hydrogen that you would need to run some of these combustion turbines on pure hydrogen, the answer today is just a robustness of storage on site to make that happen. And that is just really not economical unless you have natural geologic formations um, at your site or very close nearby. Um, our, our ACES Delta Utah project is one of those projects that has that, and it makes it economical for the, the Intermountain Power Plant there to, to do a 30% blend. And they have capacity, storage capacity to handle much more than that in the coming years. Um, but for a large number of projects that isn't readily available. So if you think about kind of all those cost drivers and when, if you're thinking about a project like this, um, you, you really need maybe that dedicated supply line so that you can start to limit the amount of on-site storage you need um, to make these things really economical going forward. Um, so really that's, that's kind of the, the I'm, brief short punchline of this topic. Um, there may be more questions related to this or just hydrogen in general. I'm happy to answer those or, or pass the baton here. Brian, one question I would have is um, the actual cost of a, a hydrogen combustion turbine. How does that compare to just a natural gas turbine? Is that fairly comparable? So um, I think the way, I, maybe the, the best or simplest way to answer that is it's just modifications to some of the parts and components of these turbines that you're, we're using today. They're not necessarily new per, per se, and it's how they're, how they're controlled, where they're injected. It's, it's just a little bit different than using natural gas. So they're, they're kind of working from the upgrading or, or retuning of that, of that turbine, it's just some upgrades and some nuances and the controls and things like that is, is my understanding more than, hey, this is a new model that we're putting out there that's different than the natural gas model that you may be using today. Got you, thank you. Uh, maybe I could ask along that same line and, and this may be um, a you know, whole new ball of wax, but um, you know, if, if we're talking about, you know, tightening reserve margins in our region and the need to add capacity and potentially in Kansas, the need to add natural gas uh, fired units because the hydrogen, you know, production transport, uh, <laughs> it isn't quite there yet. Um, one thing that, that really concerns me is, you know, these are long lived assets. If you build even a natural gas plant, which may not be quite as long lived as a, a coal or a nuclear facility, but it's a long lived asset. Um, and I, I guess to that same line of questioning Jeff had is, I mean, are there ways to future proof that investment? Is it, is it an investment that can be modified, um, to take advantage of hydrogen, say 15 years from now, uh, should that enter our thinking, um, if we're talking about new generation? Yeah, 
I, I think there's a couple ways to answer that. And it, I'll start with, we work with a lot of developers of projects today that, that are looking to be, you know, speed to market with hydrogen now. And as you are well aware, the economics and a lot of these for hydrogen just isn't quite where it needs to be for any application. Um, but there are, we are finding there are, you know, either certain markets like, like mobility right now is a first mover for hydrogen. Um, and then there's certain, you know, locations where, You've got favorable either existing assets or other things that kind of help that overall levelized cost of hydrogen come down to a much more reasonable number. So an example is we were working with a company now that's putting kind of hub and spoke models for hydrogen. And the first mover, like I said, is mobility. So we're on the hub side. So we're, we're producing hydrogen. It's, it's going to be liquid initially um, because that's how you're going to have to move it large distances today without that pipeline um, available. But what they're smart about is they recognize that, you know, the mobility offtake is much more cyclical than what they would prefer from just a pure economics perspective. They would love to have a baseload offtaker like a power plant or something, a hard to abate industry, something like that. Um, but moving that through trucks and liquid, you know, over this, it just doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless everything aligns perfectly. So what they're doing is they're, they're strategically locating these hubs um, in the pipeline corridors with the understanding that at some point in the next five or 10 years, the pipelines are going to be ready and we'll be able to move hydrogen as we do natural gas today. And that then we'll be able to feed, you know, whether it be a power plant or other hard debate industries at a much more economical level. And that gives, you know, from the economics of that hub, it allows them to have a constant baseload client essentially that makes their economics a lot better. And then you still have the mobility that has the little peaks and valleys and other things going on with it. Um, so there's a recognition there. So there, again, a first mover for, for hydrogen is mobility, but there's this. So, um, you know, I think, you know, our project in, in, the, in Utah is, if you're not familiar, it's basically producing hydrogen on site, storing it in the salt cavern. The Intermountain Power Plant is literally over the fence we're going to be feeding 30% hydrogen, blending it into natural gas that's owned by LAWDP, if I'm saying that right. And they'll have feeding power back into the, to the Los Angeles basin at you know, some greener level than it was prior. Um, that's a nice baseload. Um, but the, that's, to me, a unicorn project because they have all the, the, the drivers there to lower that cost without having to worry about the pipelines and other things that may the external factors to that project. So if we were doing something like that in Kansas, and if we didn't have the geologic formations and other things that may be required, you know, I think you could start with smaller blends. Um, we'd have to run the economics of that to say, could we do 5%, 10% today? Does that make sense just to do something? Or does it make more sense to then think about all the things that maybe need to be upgraded for say five or 10 years from now when you do want to do this at a more at a larger percentage and the economics make a lot more sense. I think there, there's an analysis there that has to happen. The, it's, that's actually what you gave me was a little different than what my question was, but I let you keep going because <laughs> that was all really good information about, you know, where we are on the economics and what needs to evolve. I, the only, I mean, I think maybe this is more of a comment and just correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, if we see that all evolving as you just laid out, which again, I think that was really great to understand what we need to see happen over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, what I'm, I guess what I'm curious about is if we think that's going to happen and we, we you know, get analysis that gives us some good degree of confidence, um, I guess what I'm concerned about is say we build a, um, a combined cycle natural gas plant. There's a lot of infrastructure that goes along with that that's going to be in place for a long time. Um, I guess I, you know, the questions I'll be asking are some assurance around, um, you know, say we've got future environmental regulations or, you know, cost volatility and, um, you know, natural gas isn't the fuel supply of choice. It becomes hydrogen in, in 20 years. Uh, the, the rate payer, the, the person paying the cost at the end of the day, wants to make sure that investment is, wasn't totally wasted. Um, 
and that a lot of that investment could be converted to use the hydrogen supply in the future. It sounds to me like there, there is some element of being able to convert um, those, those plants, uh, you know, but certainly correct me if I'm wrong, um, or if you have any idea of the magnitude of uh, what it takes to convert uh, from fully natural gas to blending in hydrogen to who knows, one day having a, a very large blend of hydrogen. Yeah, I, I don't have the specifics on what it takes or costs to convert. I can get that. I can, we can certainly feed that back to you guys as a response back after this call. But I think it goes to the broader question of kind of what Hua and Kevin were kind of talking about when we were in that discussion earlier about the, the whole system, right? And maybe there's, a, there's still a play for natural gas and maybe even coal in some instances. And, you know, and hydrogen gets a, you know, fairly or unfairly in the market, people think it can do everything and it technically can, but <laughs> there, there are niches there where it makes more sense than in others. And yes, we do have to green the grid in some sense, but it doesn't necessarily mean that hydrogen is the answer that we're just going to be burning hydrogen instead of gas. Maybe there's a, it's a combination there, or maybe it's still natural gas and kind of that, that situation that Hua talked about earlier, where you have other renewables and some gas to help with the, the the unique situations and things like that. So it's a broader question, I would say, and I, I we can get you the costs on because we are doing that at that Intermountain Power upgrading that. So I can get you some, you know, benchmark there of what that might entail. But I think that the broader question is really about does this make sense to just flip gas to hydrogen for power? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. That's really helpful, and and I. I think, you know, to the extent you have data available, I'm sure our staff would be very interested. Of course, we're always interested in cost. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank uh, Brian, you. If I, I'm sorry. Uh, Brian, if I could ask uh, kind of the general question. Uh, uh, you were touching on it, I think, in the last part of your colloquy there with uh, Commissioner French. And uh, so, I mean, my question really is so basic, and that is, what really are the practical, the economic, or the cost-effective advantages of using uh, pure hydrogen versus natural gas, where the infrastructure is already in place? You don't have to, you don't have to redesign the world. I, I, I there's something right. here I'm not getting. I sense, no. but I want you to help me find out what what is it I'm not getting. <laughs> no, I, I think you're 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 getting it, and that's like part of that broader discussion I was talking about. Is you know, so I'm our Black and Beach hydrogen person, but quite often I'm talking through these kinds of conversations and maybe at the end of it, we're not talking hydrogen anymore. So I really liked, again, what, what Hua was saying earlier, there's, there's a role for natural gas in, in these markets, right? And it's not gonna go away and we're not gonna just flip everything to hydrogen. And, and, and so in a lot of cases, it does make a lot of sense. In some cases it could work, but does it make that economic sense? And, and I don't even think you could blanketly say that you know, for power, it doesn't make sense because there are probably instances and locations and things where it does make absolute sense, but there's probably others where it absolutely doesn't. So these blanket statements that you hear about in the news and, and other, I and mean, if you go to conferences and, and it's just, you know, it's hyperbole in some sense. Um, sure. We really try to look at the unique problem that you would bring to us and say, okay, here's what we're trying to do. Here's the economics around it. And, and then Black and Beach will go in and, and then solve that problem. And it Maybe it's hydrogen, maybe it's something else, maybe it's a blend of 10 different things just to get the math right. But um, you're, you're thinking of it a lot like at least I think about it and we think about it at Black and Beach, so. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the nuanced uh, response really too. And then your, and your nuanced approach to the subject. Uh, yeah. uh, my understanding is from what I read from the EIA and other sources, Actually, we have such abundant supplies of natural gas throughout the country that uh, uh, it, it kind of belies why on the heck did we, have, well, if that's the case, then why did we have this big problem under winter, winter storm Uri, which presents a whole <laughs> host of other questions to be, to be sure, and we're not here to answer those today. But uh, sure. I appreciate your presentation very much and your candor. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Thanks, Brian. No problem. All right. Um, so 
we have Wa that's kind of a wrap up and bring things together about um, technology outlook. So I think maybe that makes the most sense to kind of do that now. And then we're going to come back to Aaron. Is that all right with everyone? And I think, have I forgotten anyone else? I don't see anyone else on here that we've got Casey still. Um, but no one else that was planned to speak other than Juan here. Uh, Aaron, correct. <laughs> okay. I think that's right. Awesome. All right. Yeah. I think um, I will just summarize what we have been, uh, everybody has been talking about um, in terms of the um, the really predict, like expected future development of events and what our thoughts in terms of trying to kind of balance reliability and um, incorporating a larger portion of renewables into the grid. And I think then what we are seeing is that um, if you look into the bottom of these two charts, if you look at interconnection queue, um, at MISO and SPP, both of them were really so, uh, solar heavy and um, backed by uh, battery storage. And I think that's really kind of un really is consistent with our expectation just because we know that from a renewable front, both MISO and SPP are heavily favoring uh, um, heavily penetrated by uh, wind at this moment. I think the ELCC for both for wind capacity in both uh, locations has been dropping. And I think we observe some curtailments um, in, uh, in MISO uh, from wind, uh, wind generation. So I think right now, uh, when looking at the next alternative renewables, it looks like solar and battery will be um, the best option to really um, increase the penetration rate. And because there are relatively complementary to the generation profile to wind. I think that's going to be benefit the grid having a little bit diverse um, uh, renewable uh, capacity um, into the system. And I, th I think then the um, we talk about the co-retirement uh, issues and what will be the replacement technology we touch upon natural gas. There are still um, some um, natural gas project being proposed in the interconnection queue, but relatively small, smaller, very small compared to uh, wind, solar, and battery. So I think the trend is that um, there is significant uh, really interest in developing solar and battery um, storage um, um, in the MISO and SPP region. I think that's going to be the what we think is going to be the largest share of new capacity additions. Um, however, given that um, strategically, we would think that um, some of the large um, gas replacement projects were trying to deal with um, a substantial amount of coal retirement might be um, come uh, to fruition. Um, but I guess uh, based on the current uh, financial incentives, the market does see the um, the IRA has provided um, additional um really financial incentive and tax credit to really uh, facilitate the development of solar and other renewables, um, including battery. Um, but um, I don't think there is visible kind of financial momentum of developing gas fire generation. So as we talked about earlier, is that whether the strategy is to develop some tech, uh, gas technology, but leave the flexibility, all the technical capability for those facilities, to really dispatch with hydrogen fuel, that could be um, the future. But I think overall, based on this development trend, our really observation and our um, kind of conclusion is that um, you need a really a portfolio or suite of tools to be able to um, really um, make sure that you can still we can still provide the same level of reliable reliable service to customers and dealing with um, some of the more frequent, um, really um, uh, extreme weather conditions. Um, in the near term, we do see that um, solar plus battery and additional all standalone battery um, 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 construction into the grid is gonna be beneficial to the grid to really help um, alleviate um, some of the, um, the pressure um, on the intermittent uh, wind and solar resources. Um, in the long term, however, we do see that there should be a very um, kind of um, 
discussion about what are the new technologies that need to be incorporated, whether it's going to be maybe the other option is going to be you have a construct gas um, gas plants, but with um, CCUS technology to really capture the carbon and store them. And that could be an option of pre dispatch uh, zero carbon technology where it's still going to be uh, providing dispatchable, reliable generation to the market. And um, so essentially from, um, from the discussion here in the near term, we think it's the lithium ion battery that can provide about, um, I, I think, um, Paige, uh, we can go to the next slide now. So in the short term, we basically think that um, the, the reliability feature need to be considered along with planned or expected um, retirement of coal capacity and the replacement will be some leasing mine battery and maybe um, selective efficient gas generation to be constructed. And then the mid to long term, what we are seeing is that um, we need to have continue to build up a short duration battery, the leasing mine, because the cost of the battery is actually uh, declining, make that very economical deployment. Um, I think the, the tax credit um, that made available in the RA is going to provide additional financial incentives for those projects. And um, then the, the, the crucial thing is that we really need to diversify from what is being um, being built and incorporated into the fleet in the future. So that needs to be considering all kinds of, of different technologies, including um, we have different kind of long, maybe long duration storage, maybe seasonal storage. And then in addition, it's gonna be, whether it's gonna be coupled the, uh, the, uh, the natural gas generation with carbon capture and sequestration technologies or deploy some of the um, natural gas facilities but with the capabilities of switching to burn hydrogen or ammonia, uh, clean hydrogen or clean ammonia um, in the future. Um, we have done some analysis with the other um, kind of at other regions, looking into really what is the absolute maximum amount of renewable you can incorporate into um, the generation uh, system. Uh, what we have find out is that um, maybe 70 to 80 percent is the absolute minimum that ma maximum you can incorporate wind and solar and um, um, all other kinds of uh, renewable uh, generation capacity. But the remaining um, 20 to 30 percent of generation is best match with some other forms of um, uh, resources, including what we talk about here. And I think uh, most importantly, it needs to really have a diversity of duration of, of the generation, all um, kind of different fuel availability, um, as well as um, maybe having also kinds of consideration, consideration of future uh, carbon footprint. Uh, any questions? Yes, well, if I could, please. Um, this is an interesting slide. Um, I. I concur completely with the first sentence. <laughs> the balance mix, I think it's critical, absolutely critical. The bottom paragraph there indicates that uh, your, your, your research or your work seems to indicate that 70 to 80% is, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a doable target. The one thing that's missing from this whole formula is the timeline. So what pace do you associate with that level of adoption? Um, I think this is really, um, I would be frank here, this is where we did this for, uh, for California. So their timeline is going to be reaching 65% by 2030, and then they're going to be zero carbon by 2045. But I think that zero carbon, they didn't really classify how much is um, like renewable and how much is other source of, of, of technology. But uh, we're talking about 2045 timeframe to reach the 70 to 80% RPS. Well, we're not California, uh, <laughs> so I, 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 I'm going to leave as a rhetorical the question of can they really attain that? Oh, that's a seems to be a political goal to me. What can can you practically attain that with the with the given uh, resources that are available, uh, the costs that are going to be borne by ratepayers, mm -hmm. and the existing technology? Right. So uh, my, my question really is. Uh, uh, isn't, isn't, it, isn't it better to maybe do some scenario planning on these sorts of things 
before yeah. we jump too quickly into a balanced mix that's uh, too heavily weighted in favor of, uh, of any one particular source that is uh, intermittent. Yes, I think I, I definitely agree with you, Commissioner Keen. Uh, the, the issue is that when do, we're doing kind of long-term planning, I think they, there are three things that we need to be kind of really consider and try to incorporate into the any strategic plan or, or recommendation. One is the technical availability, whether those technology will become feasible to be deployed by the time we want them. And the second is the cost of the technology. And when we we understand really considering all the available um, credits and all of those, um, whether um, kind of like what is the actual cost that the, the rig payers need to see. And the third is the footprint um, kind of carbon reduction goals. I think we have to be realistic rather than just to say, hey, I, I like everybody is saying 2045 and everybody is saying 2050, we just need to put in kind of that as, as an objective. Kind of the issue is that you need to consider all of those three factors and really putting a plan of overall, the, the goal is to really decarbonize the electric grid, but the pace and what technology will be replacing what um, I think is going to be managed carefully so that you really have to maintain a, a rel relatively delicate balance of all three factors because one of them going out of whack, I mean, the so whole system and the process will break down because if it's too expensive, nobody can, can afford to pay it. I mean, it doesn't doesn't matter how how green it is going to be. I mean, the consumer is going to be, uh, as, uh, they're going to suffer. Very true. Uh, to me, uh, I think rate payers have a right to expect that when we go about doing our jobs, and if we do so correctly, we're balancing affordability with reliability and resilience. And I think that's uh, that's an important. Uh, those are all important factors for us to consider. Uh, rate payers in this state have uh, have paid into um, the balanced mix that we have right now, which I think actually worked pretty well. And uh, they've done so, certainly in the case of the coal plants, by the enormous amounts that have been expended to comply with the Clean Air, uh, Clean Air Act and the, and the provisions of the Clean Air Act. Um, those, are, those are enormous investments. That isn't the kind of investment I think you turn around and walk away from tomorrow. Thank you very much for your response, Juan. Thank you. Oh, this is Leo. Just following up on, on Commissioner Keene's question, you mentioned the three your three um, legs of a stool, if you will, right? Technical availability, cost of technology, and then footprint of carbon reduction. Uh, what if you took away the political asset of that, which is just the, the carbon reduction goal? If you could discount that for a, for a hypothetical reason and look at just technical availability and cost of technology, what does that do? to your long-term plans as far as meeting their targets of reliability and resiliency rather than uh, without, without the, the adder or the external forces of carbon reduction involved? Um, I actually think that, um, so essentially the, the natural gas technology is a very good because we talk about SPP and MISO region, both are very heavy on coal. If you replace the coal capacity with natural gas, more efficient natural gas technology, and try, as I said earlier, you just like figure out what is the amount of firm fuel that you need to really hold in order to meet that um, reliability, all the, the sudden like peaking events. Um, I think that is going to generate um, a couple of good things. Is one is that it's going to be automatically reduce the carbon footprint, just because and replacing the generation that really currently were uh, fixed with coal with with gas is going to be reducing at least forty percent of the emission levels. And then um, in addition, what we would see that is that um, kind of natural gas is like very. Um, it is it's dispatchable. And I think um, we understand the technology is not, um, unlike the um, the solar or wind or battery, um, the cost decline curve may not be as um, 
aggressive as what we've seen in the new emerging technologies. Um, but is um, is very efficient. I think this material technology construction is is not an issue. Uh, we think that is actually um, maybe an if we leave the option for carbon capture and storage as well as um, some level of flexibility of switching out the turbines to really be able to take on a lower or zero carbon fuel. We, I actually think uh, this is just my personal opinion. We're not advocating this position, but I, I think that is a pretty, um, I would say, um, like regret free option um, at the moment is that when you can take advantage of whatever the future carbon um, uh, reduction or the new technology, uh, emerging technology can bring, um, while also maintain flexibility in terms of maintaining reliability and balancing with the uh, the affordability. I noticed you couple carbon capture with gas technology, which I understand. Should we also be, if we're going to consider renewables, and you know, I'm, I'm new to the term, the FACTS or the facts uh, control or the controls or technology family of, of investments that we just mentioned earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, should we, if we're going to couple carbon capture with gas technology, should we couple facts with any type of renewable technology as an investment that's a prerequisite? Yeah, I, I think I like with the technical people may be better kind of understanding that. Um, the, the kind of the issue is that, um, not the issue is, but the another concern about that is going to be um, those like uh, solar panels and the gas turbines or even battery, um, they have, um, a, like a relatively limited, a shorter like lifespan. So the battery need to be recycled and solar panel need to be replaced, wind turbines need to be replaced. Um, so the consideration will be that how much is gonna pay off in long-term if you're gonna build new things anyways. So that will be one consideration that's different from like if you putting some technology um, of, like affiliate with, with the gas generation rather than putting some technology associated with the renewable generation. Typical lifespan for, for the types of industrial scale, uh, solar and wind are what, 20 years still we're looking at? I, am, I, I think I'm just looking at retirement, I think it's 15, yeah, 20 years probably, yes. It looks like we're ready for maybe a wrap up page. Is that where we're at? <laughs> We've yep, kept you already Aaron an was, hour long. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think Aaron was going to talk about supply chain. Um, and then those are all our slides. Yeah, just uh, touch base briefly on, on supply chain. All, all of this technology and construction and infrastructure, uh, you know, improvement is great, but we've got to get to materials there. You know, when it comes to the term supply chain, you know, supply chain is is not necessarily top of mind if everything's working correctly. But I, I think all you know, all of us here on this call at some point in the last couple of years had have been told the reason why we couldn't have something that we wanted or needed was because of supply chain. So it's sort of been a dirty word to some people recently. But uh, I think it's important to just keep in mind. Uh, you know, what's been happening, what we see happening in the future and, and the recovery process to try to get materials um, on site when needed. So um, just as a high level, this first slide, just wanted to talk briefly about um, because this has been an issue now for a couple of years, there has been some uh, overall recovery signs and, and recovery has to be somewhat uh, gradual and steady, uh, mostly because, you know, your global inventory levels are, are fairly low because some of that uh, demand globally has been a little bit slow and careful to recover. And, and so because of that, you know, and, and because, you know, working on the issues for the last couple of years, there has been some improvement in recovery in some areas on, on supply chain. But we say that with caution because of those low inventory levels, uh, any sort of little uh, hiccup or increase in demand could really change things quickly. Uh, and, and that really applies to transportation as well. It, it's been good. I mean, if you recall just even a year ago, 
uh, sky, you know, skyrocketing diesel price, skyrocketing container costs. Things are very expensive to move internationally and domestically, and that's leveled off a little bit too. So as long as things don't, you know, change dramatically one direction or another, um, we should be, um, you know, looking at hopefully some lower transportation delivery costs. Uh, things that impact this, of course, are labor market shortages, strikes, our relationship globally with China and other uh, continued uh, COVID-19 issues as things get shut down and production stops abruptly. And, and, and then just, you know, some shared resource uh, constraints like uh, like microchips being basically in everything that we own and use in elect electronics are, of course, also impacting our specific equipment in our industry. Uh, some of the things that have been pretty difficult lead time wise and are slow to recover are these uh, high voltage transformer, switch gear, electrical equipment. Excuse me just a second. <clears throat> some of those are being quoted considerably far out. So there has to be some some upfront planning and and uh, maybe some you know letters of award that would occur a little earlier than usual, just to try to address that that two year um, lead time. I'm gonna take a drink real quick. Excuse me. Part of what's gonna help with that is uh, you know there has been some policy lately this last year, both in the Chips and the IRA Act that we talked about earlier. That's gonna try to drive some more domestic production and provide some supply chain relief, but those sort of high tech production facilities just take a little time to get online and really impact the overall pipeline uh, demand. So uh, it won't be instantaneous, but it's a step in the right direction for sure. Next slide. Now, for me, my personal experience is a little more solar centric. So this slide is a little bit more about uh, some of the challenges we've seen on the solar side of uh, supply chain this last year. So the first one on the slide is the ADCVD investigation, and, and this was based on a domestic supplier that had claimed that uh, some of the manufacturers in Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand were actually uh, circumventing Chinese uh, duties and tariffs. And so initial uh, investigation, and, and by the way, this is approximately 85% of our uh, global supply for so solar modules. So it's an important uh, determination as far as uh, what custom borders and protection determined. And um, so also there was a possibility of significant tariffs if wrongdoing was found enough that pretty much terrified everyone as far as um, the potential for tariffs were concerned in bringing modules to the United States. So um, the, there was an executive order in the summer that allowed for a two year bridge on no new tariffs. Uh, but we know those things can sometimes be um, reviewed, reversed. So it didn't seem to really give the industry a tremendous amount of confidence to, to move forward during this two year bridge uh, enough to move the needle anyway. But uh, we did get some initial um, results and those can be found online. But basically of the eight manufac manufacturers that were investigated, four were found to be circumventing, four were found to be not circumventing. Uh, and so this is just sort of a process that that that's going to have to occur as the investigation continues to figure out who the 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 right module manufacturers are as far as wrongdoing uh, and or following the the rules of uh, tariffs tariff law. So along with that sort of still being open because that final determination uh, could change results in May. There's also uh, something called the Weiger Forest Labor Prevention Act or UFLPA that really got started. Uh, as far as detainments go in, in summer of last year. Uh, and that threw the industry for a little bit of a loop because it wasn't perfectly clear what the traceability requirements would be as far as documentation goes. We've, we've heard um, stories of some of that documentation um, being submitted and being in the thousands, if not tens of thousands of pages. Uh, so it's significant amount of information required to prove that, uh, to prove the, you know, upstream, uh, the upstream supply chain is not being uh, is not pulling uh, any sort of their materials from uh, certain regions of China that is suspected of potentially uh, using forced labor. So, so the good news is some of that is finally being worked through to the point where uh, customs is releasing some of the detainment. 
Uh, some of the largest players, though, are still being detained. So uh, it's not a uh, green light by any means. And it's uh, but it's it's starting to resolve itself in the sense that manufacturers are getting confidence again on what's required, how to meet the requirement and how to move forward as far as documentation is concerned. And the reason this is important is because the industry generally relies on module suppliers to ship modules with the uh, shipping terms DDP, duties paid. So it's not, the responsibility is not on an EPC such as us to um, necessarily have everything required to get them into the United States. It is the responsibility of the supplier to get them cleared through customs. So it really does work in the sense that as long as you're requiring a supplier to ship DDP overseas, their responsibility to meet all the requirements is, is, is on them. In addition to, of course, all of our uh, purchase orders and, and uh, our orders with supply chain, we, we do have uh, you know, an ethics and compliance requirement globally that addresses uh, forced labor, child labor, that sort of thing. So it's important to us as a company as well, not just necessarily a checking of the box. And then the la uh, last point on IRA, we do see uh, some activity and movement on the solar front uh, to try to bring module uh, production into the United States. There's been a few announcements in the last couple of weeks that some of the major players are going to start to really uh, amp up production a little bit in the United States. It still won't meet our our need, our pipeline need by any means. Uh, so we still have a lot to do as far as figuring out okay, to meet this domestic content uh, tax incentive, which at the project level would be 10%, um, to meet that here, do we need to be a domestic product, domestic content? You know, what, are, what, what constitutes a domestic module? And some of those details are still pending. IRS Treasury is going to hopefully give more clarification in the next month or two to determine okay, as long as this percentage is manufactured in the United States, it can be considered domestic, or is it 100% every raw material that's in the module has to meet that requirement? It's a little unclear, but it could make a big difference as far as uh, the path forward. Uh, but it is going to be difficult for some of those raw materials to be online and being produced here in the United States in the near future. It's a little easier to assemble the modules with imported parts here, so it's going to be, it, we're all watching in the industry very closely to see what that determination comes back as, because it, it's, it's widely believed that if we don't, if the modules in a solar project do not meet the, uh, the, the uh, domestic content requirements, then you won't reach that 40% domestic just based on the cost of the modules. So, so yeah, so we were probably still a couple years away from really seeing domestic production really uh, having a big impact on projects that are in the pipeline, but it has definitely been a step in the right direction, and it's going to be exciting to see where things go from here. Any questions about that? I know that there was some talk a little bit about, um, you know, with the, the industry-wide crackdown on uh, forced labor with the modules UFLPA, is there something similar that's... Uh, that's being uh, seen or expected on, on the battery side and, and with uh, cobalt from Congo. And, and I think the, the answer is at this time, just from everything that I can see, there's not anything on the horizon that's similar. Not that there, there shouldn't be or that it's not important to, to us in the, in the industry, but I think there are a few sm very small differences between the situation in, in China and, and the, the situation in the Congo that Make, makes me feel like, you know, with the light that's been shown on, on the cobalt mining conditions in the, in the Congo, that sort of step may have already happened by now if it was going to. Having said that, it's always a possibility if, uh, you know, any, anything is determined that, uh, you know, that the status would change and that, that uh, importation of product would need to be uh, traced a little bit better. So it, it is a possibility. I'm not sure we're going to see that in the same way that we've seen uh, this uh, this act with uh, UFLPA for solar modules. Uh, Aaron, uh, th thank you so much for the uh, the granular uh, information. I, uh, it's, it's, it's very helpful. Uh, let me ask you this question, kind of going back to the last point that you were touching on, uh, not so much with respect to the Congo, but to what extent are solar components uh, either dependent upon or imported from China or Chinese sources of supply? Yeah, it, it, 
there is polysilicon, of course, is one of the major components. And it's been mentioned a lot lately just because it's been referenced in some of these acts, you know, traceability and so on. Um, there are sources outside of China, uh, including some small production in the U.S., uh, Germany and other countries uh, where polysilicon can be acquired, but not at the level that we we as an industry need to manufacture the modules to meet demand. So at this point, polysilicon is either sourced outside of China, it is sourced within China, but doc, but you know documented in a new, clear way of where that is from. Or you know it, it, the third is if if it's been per, you know if it's not documented well, then it's probably not going to make it through customs. So um, it, we are dependent still on China, and, and part of that is because. Um, the U.S. Pr the production of modules had shifted a decade ago to China, and a lot of the the technology, uh, you know, in manufacturing shifted to China as well. The development of processes that are required to efficiently do the technical things to ingot and wafer to cut it the right way, incorporate it into the cell. You know, those are all sort of Chinese-owned processes. So. Uh, not to say that it's exclusive and only happens in China, but that's where a lot of this technology has been developed in the last decade. Are any of these major components uh, manufactured or produced in Taiwan? Uh, yes, there are some production facilities in Taiwan. Uh, of course, a lot of the chips, uh, semiconductors are out of Taiwan as well. So there is production. I, I wouldn't say that if something occurred uh, politically to per, to Taiwan that it would have a devastating impact on the shipment of modules. Uh, you know, so if that's kind of where the question was leading, you know, I don't think that there's a huge vulnerability to what is produced there as far as solar is concerned. Uh, but it is something to always to monitor as well. Thank you very much, Aaron. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah, hopefully uh, we can get, you know, my world a lot of times is just about, uh, you know, lead times and trying to make these, uh, the procurement of these equipment packages timely and in a way that we can get these projects uh, permitted and built. That's really what, what we're after. And that's, that's what I have for supply chain. Awesome. Thank you very much, Aaron. So... Thank you for sticking with us, everyone. I think we made it through everything. Um, so we've probably worn you out, but if there's any additional questions. No, I was gonna say thank, I think you are the ones that we need to thank. Uh, I, we could have talked to you all for days and it's your valuable time that you gave us. So thank you very much. Um, I will turn, Jeff, this is actually your show, not, not the commission. So let me turn to Jeff McClanahan if he has any concluding remarks um, to wrap us up, or if, if there are any staff that wanna ask a final question, of course, I'm not going to stand in the way of that, but I, I want to respect everybody's time, uh, even though I haven't done a good, we haven't done a good job of that so far. <laughs> uh, Commissioner French, uh, if I could, I'd like to uh, second uh, your remarks, actually. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeff as quickly as I can as well. Just very briefly, I want to thank all of those at, at uh, Black and Beach for being willing to provide the commission and the public uh, that's joined us today or those that may choose to watch this uh, in a recorded format for all of this information. It's really valuable, very holistic, very uh, professionally uh, presented to us. And we're grateful, as Commissioner French indicated, for the time Black and Beach has uh, dedicated to preparing and presenting this format. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I just want to echo what the two commissioners have said. I was excited about this presentation because you can tell from the agenda, it was a bucket list of all of the issues that we have uh, concerns about or need education on. And, and uh, so I had some pretty high expectations for this and Black and Beach exceeded it. So uh, many thanks for uh, all the hard work you did and uh, for your participation and, and willingness to do this. We very much appreciate it. Justin, you got a question or a comment? No, just, just you know, thank you all very much. Very, very informative and educational. Dave Nickel with Curb, thank you very much. 
All right. With that, I think we can we can conclude and wrap up. Uh, thank you all again, and I'm sure we'll be in touch with with more questions. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Paige. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Stay safe.